What's up, y'all? As always, welcome to the channel. Hope everybody is having an excellent night, wherever you may be, whenever you might be watching this. Tonight, we're going to be responding to an SDA pastor by the name of Dennis Preby. Mr. Preby is known for his strong stances regarding traditional Adventist theology, particularly last generation theology. I wanted to respond to this specific presentation that he gave, not because of Dennis in particular, but as I've stated before, I think things like these, that's why I picked the ones that I do, <laughs> provide great examples for Christians to see, to make a number of points. And so tonight will most certainly fit that bill. One thing before we get started. I'm recovering some, from some sort of uh, upper respiratory infection of sorts, so bear with me on that. Hopefully I don't sound too nasally. Uh, maybe some people think I sound that way just naturally, so maybe you don't know a difference, but bear with me as I am recovering from some sickness, as well as uh, the sickness of a 19-month-old and everything that comes with that. But in this presentation, Dennis is presenting what are supposed to be two Gospels. And he's going to represent them by two trees. One of the trees he calls the mainstream Orthodox Christian gospel. The other is supposed to be the Adventist gospel. And it is Mr. Preby's claim that this Christian gospel tree has influenced the Adventist tree, resulting in what some people want to be a third tree that he calls patchwork theology, a hybrid, if you will. But as we will see, there's one major problem. Folks, what do you think that is? What he calls the Christian gospel ain't the Christian gospel. So it is what I have labeled as the SDA quasi-Christian hybrid gospel, if you will. Um, because a number of the things that he presents is just a big mishmash cornucopia of things. Nevertheless... The other reason that I thought this particular presentation would be helpful is because of how forthright Mr. Preby is with what Seventh-day Adventists actually believe. So you're going to see he doesn't mince words. He doesn't play word games or beat around the bush. He's one of these old school types. And for that, I want to thank him, seriously, um, because he has no issue putting the cards on the table, stating it like he actually sees it, and letting the chips fall where they may. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. Not beating around the bush and playing games and, and, and all that stuff. We can make a lot more progress um, getting that stuff out of the way. But by laying the cards on the table, that includes stating that the Christian church has a different gospel than the SDA church. And so despite his misrepresentation of the Christian gospel, he still recognizes that Adventism and Christianity are at odds with one another on this area. So I appreciate that. So take notice of that. This man is willing to actually admit what's really going on. But in the process of this comparison, he provides a number of things across the board that will be particularly helpful for Christians to see and hear to better understand how you can better be equipped to reach Seventh-day Adventists with the true Christ and his gospel, which is precisely why. AnsweringAdventism.com exists. This is the central hub of our platform. Please be using this, folks. It is a gift from us to you. It is where you can contact us, share your testimony, ask a question, donate. You can browse our extensive library of question and answer content. Before emailing questions, please, please, please check the library. You can come into these various categories and search by category. You can come up to the search bar. You can search by phrases. You can search by topics. You can search by keywords. You can search by anything to your heart's desire. You can type in parts of a word anywhere that it populates. It's only going to give you a 10 in the drop down. If you want to see what else there is, no problem. Just hit enter. It'll take you to the whole library of anything on here that contains the phrase contradict. Okay? You can come on here. Let's say we want to go to this one. All the stuff that you see in red, all of that is hyperlinked. 
If you want to see the primary source for it, simply click and it'll take you right to it. And it gives you the breakdown. Scripture, you don't need to click. You can just hover. It'll pop right up for you. And you can browse to your heart's desire and content. So please, please, please be using this. Because like I said, this is a gift from us to you. And we really want you to be using it. Get yourself equipped to be able to engage with Seventh-day Adventists apologetically. Because again, they need the true Christ in his gospel. With me tonight is somebody I'm grateful to now call a friend. Richard Foster. Richard and his family were former Seventh-day Adventists. And he was particularly into Dennis Preby and his representation of Adventism when he was an Adventist. So I thought, you know, what the heck? He'd probably be the perfect guest to bring on for this particular stream. So with that said, brother, thank you for being here. Oh, sorry. I do that every time. I had you muted just because I didn't want any background noise to come through. And then I forgot to unmute you after I asked the question. Let's try this again. Welcome for being here or welcome. Uh, uh, thank you for being here and welcome. <laughs> Anything that you would like to share before we get into? I I know that uh, you may not consider yourself anybody special. Richard's con uh, contributed some stuff to the Answering Adventism website. Uh, probably will continue to in the future as well. So really appreciate him. But anything else that you would like to share for the audience that may be relevant to tonight? Well, like you said, I was really a Dennis Preeby kind of Adventist. Um, every Adventist, it's apparent if you start visiting and make friendships with various Adventists, every Adventist has their own celebrity Adventist pastor. They kind of gravitate to um, their guy that they're in with, you know, like some or like I have one friend that's all about Doug Batchelor and whatnot. Well, for me, it was Dennis Preeby and uh, his message of sinless perfection. And, you know, you can get to the place where you're not going to sin anymore, etc. Yeah. Well, he's going to get into that tonight, of course, because that's central to his understanding of Adventism, which I would argue is the consistent understanding of systematic SDA theology. Um, but with that said, let's segue right into it here. So remember, folks, like I said, he starts off by uh, what he's going to call the uh, presenting uh, the tree of what's supposed to be the Christian gospel. Um, and I have labeled it for a specific reason, the SDA quasi-Christian hybrid gospel, because both of these trees that he presents are informed by the great controversy theme in the way that he describes and understands the general things, which you, you, you guys will see this, but just a little bit of backstory as to why I'm calling it what I am. So with that said, let's uh, dive right into the first uh, section here. Now, in what I'm covering this morning, I am uh, not going to give a Bible study this morning. This first one will be an introduction. This will be a, an analysis of... Uh, Two different gospels. You have two gospel trees in front of you, two descriptions of the gospel. I'll be putting the very same things up here on the screen so you can see exactly where we are at each point. And uh, we will look at what these really mean, what, how to identify them, how to make an intelligent decision about them, and we will try to understand how best we can determine which is the true gospel. In fact, the real issue, the real question for today is very simple. What is unique what is special about Seventh-day Adventism? What makes Adventism worth living for and, yes, even dying for? What is the key point of Adventism? And no, it is not the Sabbath. No, it is not the state of man in death. No, it is not even the second coming of Jesus Christ. The heart and soul of what makes Adventism unique, special, and different is its understanding, believe it or not, of how a person is saved by the life and death of Jesus Christ, how salvation works. Now you say that doesn't sound quite right because that's what every Christian church talks about, how to be saved, how righteousness works. But I'm going to share with you why I believe this is what makes Adventism totally unique and special. All right? Okay, so... It is a distinction worth dying for. So Adventism is worth dying for. Catch that, folks. 
That's the proposition he's going to be making. That's the central thesis he said of this presentation. It's a series of videos, but this is the introduction one where he kind of does an, an overview of all things, which is why we picked this one. But catch that. This difference is so big, it is worth dying for. And I appreciate that he just comes out guns blazing and just says the truth. Short, sweet, to the point. And I actually think this guy's sincere because he's actually honest enough to say it like it is. So he clarifies, this isn't going to be a Bible study. He's giving an analysis for us. That's the context. Richard, what are your thoughts on what he has said so far? Well, he absolutely shoots it straight. Like you said before in the intro, you know, we have to commend the guy. You know, he's not beating around the bush trying to do these uh, PR statements like so many Adventist pastors and leaders are. He's shooting it straight out there that Adventism has a different gospel and that's what makes it unique. You know, it's not the Sabbath. Um, other groups believe Seventh-day Sabbatarianism. It's not yeah. the state of the dead. You know, other groups believe that you, you're you asleep when you're dead. But uh, it's this particular understanding of how somebody gets saved, which we're going to get into here in a minute. So uh, I won't jump the gun, but uh, definitely um, what I found to be the case when I was an Adventist is... Um, that's what it's all about is this understanding of basically salvation through internal righteousness, through doing all these things. This progressive sanctification is what's going to make you righteous to stand in the sight of a holy God. Yeah. I, I the, the first thing when I, so I've listened to this probably five times now, because I sent this to you weeks ago when we, when we were planning for this. And I'm just thinking to myself, Adventism is worth dying for. <laughs> Adventism is worth dying for. Folks, riddled. Think, of the, think about the track record. Riddled with failed and false prophecy from false prophets. William Miller, Ellen White, Samuel Snow, who believed he was Elisha the prophet before the second coming. Cover-ups and fraud. James White embezzling, removing statements from Ellen White's writings. I'm trying to find one right now. Some she said about kids that they forgot to sweep from the metadata of the website. So it still populates when you search, but then you click into the letter and it's omitted. Well, I found it in physical form, so I'm waiting for the book to get here. Nevertheless, Christological heresy. It was started by vehement anti-Trinitarian heretics. A false Christ who was made equal with the Father, didn't cancel any sin at the cross, is not ruling and reigning as a priest king right now. Stick around for next week, folks. That's what next week's topic of video is going to be about. Seated on his throne over heaven and earth. Because Ellen claimed this. Here's why I say that. It's not me just talking out of the side of my neck. This is the first vision, folks. December 1844, supposedly. Notice what's said here. About four months since I had a vision of events all in the future. And I saw the time of trouble such as never was. Jesus told me. That's the word of God. Jesus told me. It was the time of Jacob's trouble and that we should be delivered out of it by the voice of God. Just before we entered it, we all received the seal of the living God. Then I saw the four angels cease to hold the four winds, and I saw famine, pestilence, and sword. Nation rose against nation, and the whole world was in confusion. Then we cried to God for deliverance day and night till we began to hear the bells on Jesus' garment. And I saw Jesus rise up in the holiest. And as he came out, we heard the tinkling of the bells and knew our high priest was coming out. Then we heard the voice of God, which shook the heavens and earth and gave the 144,000 the day and hour of Jesus's coming. Then the saints, that's them, the little flock at the time, were free, united and full of the glory of God, for he had turned their captivity. And I saw a flaming cloud come where Jesus stood, 
and he laid off his priestly garment and put on his kingly robe. Took his place on the cloud which carried him to the east where it first appeared to the saints on earth, a small black cloud which was the sign of the Son of Man. While the cloud was passing from the holiest to the east which took a number of days, the synagogue of Satan worshipped at the saints' feet. Close quote. So she had a vision where Jesus told her the day and the hour of his coming. False. They were the 144,000. False. Jesus is wearing Levitical priesthood garments in heaven. False. Jesus is yet to take the role of a king. False. While they can tell us they believe Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, they don't actually understand what that entails. And this proves it. Levitical garments, folks, were unique to the Levites. Even if we wanted to grant the SDAs one of their favorite, you know, their Roy Gain, it was only a vision. She wasn't saying he's actually wearing those. It just represents a function. You still have them representing a function. <laughs> she claims here to see a true change of Jesus's function, just like they claimed happened in 1844, where he'll take off the priestly garment, a.k.a. he'll cease functioning as a mediator, and he puts on the kingly. He assumes the function now of a king. She did not understand that Melchizedek, unlike the Levites, was both a high priest and a king. He was a priest king, Hebrews 7.1. So Jesus functions as a high priest king right now. He's already ruling and reigning as all of his enemies are being made his footstool. And he will forever be in that role, bridging the gap between God and man as the God-man himself forever, which is what he is doing currently. He will never cease from that. He will reign forever as a priest king. There's another, like a whole host of problems beyond that regarding the Adventist Jesus. But all of that to say, Mr. Preby, I don't think that's all worth dying for. I don't think that's worth dying for. He continues. I'm going to go right up these trees. We're going to take a look at them and see what we can find. We're going to start with the tree that is on the left-hand side of your paper, and we're going to identify as we go. This gospel says that sin, and the problem with us is we are sinners. The question is why? How did we get that way? What is this sin problem that we have? And this gospel says sin is not what you say or do or think. Sin is what Adam did and said and thought, as well as Eve. In other words, when Adam and Eve sinned, they not only turned this world upside down, they turned our natures inside out, so that the nature that God gave us, which was loving and kind and generous and faithful and obedient, now became jealous and proud and arrogant and disobedient. And we fight against those natures every day of our lives. So these natures that we receive from Adam and Eve, this gospel says that is our sin. All you have to do to become a sinner in the sight of God is to get yourself born and draw your first breath. Sin is the nature that you inherited at your birth. Now, as we go through this little study this morning, I'm going to be sharing little uh, snippet statements from various individuals. And I want you to remember one thing as we go through these little statements. Every statement that I will read on both sides of these gospel trees is from a Seventh-day Adventist. It may be a teacher, a pastor, a layperson, but all of the statements are from Seventh-day Adventists that I'm going to share with you. Here's the first one. Okay. So that's why I also called it a quasi-SDA gospel because the statements that he's reading from tonight, folks, are from Seventh-day Adventists. All of them. So remember that. But this is supposed to be the Christian gospel. Right off the bat, he says, Christians do not believe sin is what you say, do, or think. Richard, hmm. is that true? Absolutely not. Um, you know, sin is multidimensional. And first of all, I would point out that the Greek word used in the New Testament for sin does include more than just action. Um the idea behind it is of missing the mark. If you think of um, like an arrow shooting at the target and missing the mark, that's what is being conveyed when the word sin is used. And however, 
as we know, sin does include more than that. From, from that missing the mark proceeds all these actual corruptions, all these instances where we fall short, where we don't love God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we don't love our neighbor as ourself. And so that's just patently false, that it's only our nature. You know, um, of course, you know, Christians would, would believe more than that. As, yeah. Go ahead. Anything else? Oh, I mean, it's. <laughs> I just didn't want to cut you off. It's, You're good. It's, if you don't have anything else, I mean, it's it's evident that we believe more than that. I mean, read creeds and confessions. I mean, <laughs> read expositions of the law written by Christians, um, and the great detail that these theologians, these great men that the Lord has given the church over the ages, have given of all the different ways we can sin against God. I mean, that's a total misrepresentation to say yeah. it's only nature. Now he would, he would, he's would argue that sin doesn't have that dimension of nature, that it's only behaviors and that's where yeah. he would get it wrong. But it's a total straw man to say that Christians don't believe that actions, thoughts, you know, words, deeds, etc our sin. Yeah. So he badly, badly, badly engages in the fallacy of conflation. He conflates original sin, the teaching and doctrine around headship, man being a fallen creature, dead in sins and trespasses, Ephesians 2, which is regarding man's sinful condition with what sin is in general. So folks, we have an article on this on our website. What is sin? Please come and, and check this out. Again, it's all hyperlinked. I mean, we go into this in great detail because this is one of the major problems that the Adventist church deals with, which is their very truncated view of sin. But as you can see, we get into, and this isn't answering Adventism's unique opinion, by the way. Um, we get into a variety of categories. So to say that it's not behavioral or that Christians don't believe it's behavioral and what he's presenting is supposed to be the Christian gospel um, is not uh, not entirely accurate. But Richard, the reason it's not an accurate representation is because of what I would say, Romans 5, 12 through 21. Even if he wants to argue, it's only behavioral. It's not conditional. Because he kind of says this in, in like a little bit of like a balking and scoffing sort of way of like, they believe this and, and that's in error. He said when Adam and Eve sinned, they turned our natures inside out. Yes, M Mr. Preeby, th that's what being dead in sins and trespasses, mm -hmm. a, ch a child of wrath by nature is. But the SDA system does not have a category for this. The SDA church is stuck in strictly a physical frame of reference, which also explains why they don't properly understand the new birth and being born again. And all of that ultimately stems from them not understanding union with Christ. That's what it ultimately comes down to, is not understanding union with Christ, because that involves being made a new creature in Christ. That's not just behavior modification, like they like to say. Um, there's something a lot bigger going on there. All right. So he said all the statements moving forward are from Seventh-day Adventists. Remember that. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. That's this statement right here. A baby is born a sinner before it has ever committed one sinful act. Now, what is the implication of that? Here's another statement. This sinful state means that if a baby dies a few hours after birth, he or she is subject to the second death, even though he or she has never broken any commandment. That is what sin as nature is teaching, that every baby born is born under condemnation every baby born. And of course, the solution for that in many churches is infant baptism because of this very serious problem.
that we are born as sinners because Adam sinned. So that's the bottom line of this gospel, this understanding. Okay, so he says this so assuredly. Babies who die hours after death because of a sinful nature, if they have a sinful nature, they'll be subject to the second death, which he means essentially damnation. As if it's just a guarantee. <laughs> but he conveniently ignores that God has the same freedom to save infants that he does adults. He's not limited by creatures, meaning like level of development. So his anthropocentric way of thinking is clouding his, his judgment here. But again, their system has no category for such a thing because of that. They say the they, they hold to the whole age of accountability that isn't found in scripture anywhere to try and give a pass to all like 10 to 11 and under year olds. By rejecting this to be consistent, he also has to reject Jesus, the second Adam, as the new federal head. Like if you're going to balk and scoff at the idea of uh, representation, headship, the idea of, yeah, a baby is, is born a human, therefore, like all humanity, they have a federal head. He's essentially just getting at the Augustinian Pelagian controversy here and then saying this is the gospel, which we'll get into that in a little bit, a little bit more later. But that's the consistent ends of what he's essentially rejecting is if you reject all humanity having a federal head, then you then have to reject Jesus being the new federal head, which I guess to be consistent, um, that would make sense for the last generation theology types. Um, but it, again, it does not align with the Apostle Paul in Romans 5. When Adam sinned, all sinned. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. The all there is referring back to the all that it says are in Jesus. So all that are in Adam receive condemnation. All that are in Jesus receive eternal life, redemption, all the benefits of being united to Christ as your new federal head, etc. I mean, heck, he says, for as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. I mean, Romans 5.19 is just... But then he mentioned infant baptism, Richard, and original sin. Before we get to that, I guess, anything that you have to say, period. But then I want to ask you, why do we as Protestants affirm infant baptism? Um, because what he presented is more of like a Roman Catholic or an Eastern understanding of why they baptize infants. Um, tell us why we believe in infant baptism over and against that claim, but then anything else that you want to add on that? Well, yeah, he assumes the baptismal regeneration position that Protestants or whoever for that matter. I mean, to be honest, some churches do hold that position, as you mentioned. But he assumes that everyone baptizes an infant in order to wash away this guilt of original sin. And um, he may be oblivious. I know I was until I studied into the issue of the covenantal perspective that we find in the scripture, that in every covenant, God has included not only believers, but their children. And in the newer and better covenant, we hold that that pattern has not ceased. I mean, for that matter, it says explicitly in Acts 2.39 that the promise is to you and to your children. And so us Protestants who are pedo baptistic that just means an infant, that word pedo we hold that because God has always included believers and their children in his covenants, we don't see that as changing under the new and better covenant. And so infants ought to receive that covenant sign of entry into that covenant, not to wash away some, some guilt, but to show that God includes them. Um, go look up 1 Corinthians 7.14, for example, and what it says about the children of believers being holy. It's the same Greek word used for saint there. And, you know, you... The viewers may not have studied this issue out. They may disagree with what I'm saying and what we believe as uh, 
you know, Presbyterian oriented guys. But the reality is we're not baptizing an infant to wash away that guilt. Right. We're baptizing an infant because of God's promise that when that infant comes to faith in Christ, everything signified in that baptism is freely theirs. Yeah. Yeah. So all that, not to sidetrack tonight into infant baptism, but really just to say that um, that's that's not necessarily why Protestants hold to infant baptism, Mr. Preby. Um, there are some people uh, that, that would, um, but all that to say that it's just kind of an insight into where we're headed in the sort of understanding of these things. His whole issue is really so far stemming from a faulty view of covenant and headship. <laughs> Cause that's exactly why we baptize infants. <laughs> and is, already, and that's, that's, he's, already he's straw man, um, you know, and saying, you know, I implying at least that everyone who does infant baptism is doing it for this reason. Otherwise, if the baby dies, the baby is condemned. Of course, not realizing that, you know, we believe in such a thing as elect infants. Yeah, that, that God has the, has the same freedom infancy. to save infants that he does adults. Right. Like, God, God is not dependent upon somebody's age as to who he can save. However, in the Adventist system of hyper free will, I would call it, you know, obviously the child can't hear all these things. They must do things that he's going to talk about in a little bit. And so because they can't do that, if they were guilty, you know, how could they be saved? And so his solution is to suggest that they're not guilty, that there's some sort of um, intermediate state um, between sinner and righteous. They're going to become a sinner inevitably, but they're not right now. It just it doesn't make any sense. Uh, one more thing I wanted to point out is it ultimately gets back to the question of which comes first. Do human beings, do we as human beings sin because we are sinners or are we sinners because we have sinned? And in previous system, clearly his thinking is you're not a sinner until you make that decision to commit that for sin. And if that's the case, I would just ask, why is sin universal? If it's just a fallen nature that we're born with, just a tendency to sin, how come nobody has ever escaped that? How come it inevitably brings us all into sin and the need of salvation? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and, and I don't want to jump the gun, folks, because we're, we're going to I want to get going here because we are going to have a lot of stuff to to look at tonight um, and it will pick up the pace. He's, he's starting a little bit slow here, but I, I just want to highlight. We haven't heard the gospel yet. I know we're talking about original sin and infant baptism, et cetera. That's not really what's in focus tonight. We're kind of just commenting on some of the things he's saying here in passing. But I want people to, to, to focus in on that. This is the gospel. We're told this is the mainstream Christian gospel. So just remember that as we're moving forward. Whoops. And if this that's true, then the next point is obviously true. That Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this world, if he is to be my Savior, he cannot be a sinner. And so therefore, if sin is the nature that I am born with, then without even opening the Bible at all to read one Bible text, it is absolutely essential that Christ not have our nature. So Christ has to have Adam's unfallen nature. There is no possibility of any other option. Christ must have an unfallen nature. So those are the first two points of this gospel. And because that is so crucial to this gospel, I want to make sure we understand it. So I'm going to go back down to that first point again, sin as nature, and look at it carefully. Here's a baby born into this world, born under condemnation, born lost. That baby growing up accepts Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. At that point, the fallen nature does not disappear. It comes under the control of the Holy Spirit. We call it the new birth. So that means that that fallen nature is just as much sin after the new birth as it was before the new birth. It is sinning still by nature. 
So after the new birth, the difference is that we are forgiven for that nature. So the nature is still sin, but we have forgiveness for it. And that's all well and good. But now we come to a point called the close of human probation. And at the close of human probation, there is no evidence in Scripture or in any inspiration that we are going to lose our fallen natures at that point. In fact, the only time we'll ever lose that fallen nature that we were born with is when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. Richard. Thoughts on that? Well, he said there's no evidence that we're going to lose our fallen nature at this close of probation. I would just say that, you know, he's obviously assuming Adventist great controversy theology into things. There's no evidence in the scripture of this Adventist concept of the close of probation, where if you don't have your whole act together and do all these things you're supposed to do that now it's too late for you. I mean, scripture is clear that Christ always lives to make intercession for us. And so this whole thing is obviously assuming great controversy, Ellen White teaching into the Bible. Yeah. 100. Well, that's why I was saying it's a quasi like SDA Christian hybrid thing. Cause even the fact that he's mentioning uh, the close of human probation, he's talking about this tree that's supposed to be the mainstream Christian gospel, but then he's importing into it. Because remember, he's he's trying to say that Adventists have been influenced by this. So there's still elements of Adventism that are ported in, and then they're trying to understand those things, in this case, the close of human probation, through this other gospel. And that's what he's going to call patchwork theology later. But I want to highlight, and I'm going to be saying this a lot tonight, folks, We still haven't heard the gospel. We've heard what's going to develop into comparing systematic theology, but we haven't heard the gospel yet. Interesting. This, what he said here, is insight into the weak understanding of glorification in their theology. That's the key issue. Did you notice he said, there's no evidence in scripture or in any inspiration? meaning scripture and Ellen White. I just thought that was interesting. Like when I heard that, I played that back. I've probably heard that now like 10 times. I'm like, did I hear that correctly? He says, there's no evidence in scripture or in any inspiration. But he's essentially, folks, regurgitating what Ellen White said. How do we know that? Well, it's of course. Sons and Daughters, January 3rd. So this is a book that's a 365 type thing. You have something for each day. This is January 3rd from that book, page 9. Quote, We are not to settle down expecting that a change of character will come to us by some miraculous work when Jesus shall appear in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. No, my young friends, we're judgment bound and probation is granted to us here in this life in order that we may form characters for future immortal life. Close quote. So despite her false view of resurrection, which is really more like cloning, as we'll see in a moment, we've looked at before, she clearly says no changing character is going to happen at Christ's return. One must get to a perfected character right now. That's what probation's for. Nothing will change in the human will, according to her. So he's right. That's why Adventist theology purports that with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can essentially get to a glorified state now through mere behavior modification. All that's lacking at that point is access to the tree of life and the body of new particles that Ellen claimed God would make and pour into that new body a person's character from his memory. But that misses a key aspect of glorification. Look how the Westminster Confession describes this. Uh, We could look at others. It's not like this is whole cloth unique to the Westminster. But notice what it says. The bodies of men after death return to dust and see corruption. But their souls, which neither die nor sleep, having an immortal sustenance, immediately return to God who gave them. The souls of the righteous, being then made perfect in holiness, are received into the highest heavens, 
where they behold the face of God in light and glory, waiting for the full redemption of their bodies. And the souls of the wicked are cast into hell, where they remain in torments and utter darkness, reserved to the judgment of the great day. Besides these two places for souls separated from their bodies, the scripture knoweth none. So the key being, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Where are they pointing to Hebrews? Or where are they pointing to for this? Hebrews chapter 12. What does it say? Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. For you've not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet, a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further message be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you, following with the, the compare and contrast throughout the whole book, but you, the new covenant believer, have come to the Mount Zion and the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So this is doing a compare and contrast between the new covenant believer and the old Mosaic covenant believer. And it uses Mount, Zion, Mount Sinai in contrast to Mount uh, Zion to show why Mount Zion is a better mountain, uh, why Jesus is a better Moses, etc. That's the sort of thing that's going on here. Now, ironically enough, Ellen White taught that the spirit of a person was their character. Now, like I said, we've looked at this before on the channel regarding their teaching on resurrection. This is the SDA Bible Commentary by way of Ellen White. Quote, Our personal identity is preserved in the resurrection, though not the same particles of matter or material substance as went into the grave. It is not the self-same body. The wondrous works of God are a mystery to man. The spirit, the character of man, is returned to God there to be preserved. In the resurrection, every man will have his own character. Again, in Last Day Events, page 295. Quote, If you would be a saint in heaven, you must first be a saint on earth. The traits of character you cherish in life will not be changed by death or by the resurrection. You will come up from the grave with the same disposition you manifested in your home and in society. Jesus does not change the character at his coming. The work of transformation must be done now. Again, probation. Our daily lives are determining our destiny. Defects of character must be repented of and overcome through the grace of Christ. And a symmetrical character must be formed, talking about a symmetrical character to Christ, while in this probationary state that we may be fitted for the mansions above. So Richard, if you plug that definition into what the author of Hebrews tells us, new covenant believers, unlike the saints of old, come to a better mountain, Mount Zion, over and against Sinai. He's sticking with the entire theme he's, he's been talking about up to this point, all the, way, uh, all the ways that the new covenant is better. But he tells us that believers can approach this better mountain where there's a festal gathering of angels, the saints of old, and the spirits of the righteous made perfect. All of these are obviously animated creatures sentient, they're aware, etc. A personality or character of a person is not animate. But let's grant them their definition of spirit being a person's character. If we plug that into Hebrews 12, there's a change of character happening. Yeah. The, character is made, the character is made perfect. So even with their faulty definition, you still have a change in character happening at a period outside of the, the supposed probation window. And the whole thing is a failure to understand that God works in process. You know, if yeah. we consider the whole of Scripture, God works through processes over and over again, typically gradually. I mean, we see creation done over, you know, six days. Obviously, God could have done it in a second, but he did it over six days. We see 
a time period elapsed between when sin enters and when the Savior comes. We see that Scripture, God gave it gradually over a period of roughly 1,500 years. And so God's pattern is to work gradually in these things. And that's what he does with us. And so we come to Christ, we are justified, sin's penalty is removed. We also receive sanctification at that moment, being set apart to God, which yeah. is what it means in its most basic sense. But then a process begins of growing in Christ, which continues through our life. And at the end of our life, or, you know, if the Lord came back first, there's that glorification that happens where we enter into the state of glory. And so there's a process. But what Adventist theology does is it short circuits the process. It puts glorification here and now into sanctification. I mean, get a Bible definition of what it means to be glorified. For example, Romans 3, the Apostle Paul tells us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is the opposite of the glory of God, i.e. glorification. And so when we're no longer sinning is when we shall have that glory. Well, Adventists themselves will say glorification happens at the second coming or in the life to come, but then they will import what biblical glorification would be, the absence of sin, into the present. And again, you know, so many failures to make distinctions, you know, conflating, obviously they conflate justification and sanctification, as we'll see him do more as we go on, but also conflating glorification and sanctification as well. Yeah, totally. Well, and he said, there's no biblical evidence of the character you know, being changed or anything. No, Dennis, you're wrong. By the way that your prophetess defines spirit as character, that would mean the author of Hebrews is saying the character of the righteous is made perfect upon death because it's talking in the present tense. It's not, oh, because I've heard Adventists try and say, oh, no, that's that Hebrews 12 is talking about this long thing off in the future about uh, that's the people who have made it. They, they, they are arrived at perfection and then they were they were made righteous here and then arrived and got there to the, the city because we're not there yet. That type sort of stuff, you know, despite Even Paul saying present. that. Right. And despite the fact that Paul says we're by being united to Christ, you're presently seated with him in the heavenlies. All these now and not yet type um, things that are presented. But um, to answer that, Dennis, yes, both your inspired prophetess and scripture say such. So to say that there's nothing in scripture about that is just um, kind of odd. But he continues. So that means we are still sinning by nature after the close of probation. And that means we still need forgiveness after the close of probation, which means Jesus cannot step out of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, which means there must be forgiveness for ongoing sin right up until the second coming of Christ. So that is what this teaching says. We sin from the moment of our birth to the moment of our death or until Jesus comes. And we need forgiveness for constant sin all the way to the second coming. Sin is as constant as breathing. All right, to the second point, Jesus Christ. You know, it really isn't about his nature. It's about how he was tempted. Adam and Eve in the garden. Could Satan make life miserable for Adam and Eve by harassing them around the garden day after day? The rules were very strict, weren't they? One tree, one tree not only in the, ga in the garden, but in the whole world at which they could be tempted. Would you like that arrangement? One tree of temptation. You'd have to go out there to find temptation. Well... After Adam and Eve sinned, did the rules of engagement change? Where could Satan now tempt Adam and Eve? Anywhere, anytime. Out there somewhere? Do you have to go over there to find temptation? Or do you have to wake up in the morning, go to sleep at night, and he's there pulling at you through your nature? All right. 
So the rules today are, is Satan has access to you constantly through your own nature, through the nature that you have within you. And so the real question comes down to this. How was Christ tempted, like Adam or like us? That's the issue of the second point. And you know, this gospel says, not like us, like Adam. In fact, I've heard one explanation that says Christ was tempted three times in his experience. He was tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was tempted at the cross of Calvary. And the unique thing about all those three is he went over there to find temptation. Not back in Nazareth, but he went out there. And there he was tempted in the wilderness, in the garden, at the cross. So Christ was tempted like Adam was tempted over there, outside of himself. Not tempted to be angry, not tempted to impatience or pride or selfishness or overeating or all of the temptations that we have. But just on the great issues, would he carry out his mission as the Messiah? Would he be obedient to his heavenly Father in dying for the sins of mankind? So the bottom line of the second point is Christ was not tempted in the same areas that we are tempted. He was not tempted from within. That would make him a sinner. He was tempted only from without, as Adam was tempted. So those are the first two points in this gospel. Now we come to where the rubber begins to hit the road. Justification, salvation. And you notice that it says justification only not sanctification. Here's the reason for it. I'll share it from a statement. Justification is 100% Christ's work. Sanctification is a work done by us, aided by the indwelling Christ. Well, my friends, is a work done by us worth anything for salvation? Zero. Which means that if justification is 100% his work and sanctification is a work done by us, that sanctification cannot be part of the saving equation of the way we are saved. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? Let's say that you've been uh, a faithful Sabbath keeper for a year or so, but you've decided that in these hard economic times you really can't feed your family, clothe your family, without opening your business on Sabbath. And so you decide reluctantly to go against the convictions of your heart and open your business on Sabbath and keep it open regularly. Does that in any way jeopardize your salvation? Now that would be a sanctification issue, wouldn't it? The keeping of the seventh day Sabbath on a regular basis. And sanctification, according to this gospel, is not part of the gospel. It's a result of the gospel. It happens after you're saved. You're saved, and then the sanctification process takes over, and it isn't crucial to salvation. So let me read you a little statement by somebody who has kind of thought about this subject a little bit. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God. Is that correct? That is correct. Since right behavior is never the ground of our acceptance with God, wrong behavior cannot keep a person out of heaven. Follow that little bit of logic? Since right behavior won't get you in, wrong behavior won't keep you out. One is not lost by not keeping the Sabbath or giving up the Sabbath. One is saved because one chooses to enter into a saving relationship with Jesus. The only way to lose that salvation is if a person chooses to reject that saving relationship. See, this is a very simple gospel. There is one way into salvation, except Jesus Christ as your Savior. Once you have done that, there is only one way out of salvation, to lose your salvation, and that is to turn your back on Jesus Christ and say, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm going my own way. And yes, you can lose your salvation experience with Jesus Christ by doing that. But anything in between that, you're still saved. Sabbath breaking, sanctification issue, you're still saved. As long as you are justified, as long as you are forgiven, you are still saved. Withholding of tithe, you're still saved. And we could go down the whole list, including adultery, and you're still saved. Because all sanctification issues are non-salvation issues. And the only way to lose your salvation is to reject justification as forgiveness. 
and then you can lose your salvation. So that becomes the critical issue of this gospel. Justification alone is the issue in salvation. Okay, so <clears throat> I know that was a lot. Um, that was probably the longest one out of all of them, but I wanted, to, I wanted to catch all that. He just assumes their doctrine of probation, which I get it. He said at the, at the beginning, it's a compare and contrast, not a Bible study. Uh, but there's an agreed upon belief between these two supposed gospels. Because notice, he's, he's trying to talk about what's been, this is the sort of thing these other Adventist pastors are saying. They've taken this Christian gospel and tried to adventize it, if you will. Um, but again, this is all through the great controversy theme. And furthermore, the more, the more important part, and as it goes along further, folks, I'm going to keep asking this. We haven't heard the gospel yet. Richard, is probation a part of the gospel? Absolutely not. I mean, probation is what happened back, clear back in the garden. I mean, Adam was given a law and he failed to keep that law. And, uh, you know, again, we talked about representation a little bit earlier. You know, once, once he failed, it's done. And so... Once we get past that point, the gospel enters in, grace enters in. You know, as I listened to um, to that clip, it was almost God excruciating, you know, that he's describing, it's clear, you know, the that there's this concept of salvation that God is sort of using it as some sort of a punitive club. If you don't do everything right, I'm yanking it out from under you. And of course, he mentioned, you know, big sins, you know, like committing adultery and such. But what about all the numerous little sins that we all struggle with every day? What about the greatest commandment, the fact that we don't love God with all our heart, soul, and strength every minute, and don't love our neighbor as ourself every minute? Is our, saint, is our uh, salvation being yanked because of that in his mind? That'd be my question. Yeah, and that's exactly it. Is this Again, it goes back to this very truncated view of sin. Because when you take umbrage with them on stuff like he just said, they're going to say, well, then they're going to jump to this other extreme. Oh, so you're saying people can just live however they want? Adultery doesn't matter? It's like, whoa, buddy, relax. That's not what's being said at all. It's because you have this very narrow, small, honed in sort of view of sin. First John three, it's transgression of the law. Therefore, it's the letter of the Ten Commandments. When it's not even saying, Mr. Preby, if you have an impure thought. But then they'll get into stuff like, well, that wasn't volitional. That wasn't by choice or, you know, these sorts of things. And it's like, well, guy, you're missing it. You're, you're missing it. They don't have a concept of both Christ's passive and active obedience, which is what is, is required. It's what Christ passively did as the, the free will, the ultimate free will offering as the suffering servant um, over and against what he did not do and abstained from doing constantly, actively, moment by moment, second by second. That's the standard, sir. It's not just, oh, well, today did I bow down to a statue? Did I worship any other false gods? Did you put anything in your life that day ahead of God? Then it was an idol. It's not just bowing down to statues or these very like caricatured ways that they'll often present, you know, what sin is. And then so when you disagree, they think you're saying these like, oh, it's so easy to do. Just go to church on Saturday. Don't tell any lies. Don't commit adultery. Don't bow down to a statue. Don't worship a false God by, you know, accept Jesus, the, the true God and obey your parents and that's really all. It's just like, and then when you disagree with them, it's like, oh, so you're saying you can do, you can break those things. Well, that's, you're, you're missing the whole point. It's way deeper than that, my man. You, it, you're, you're missing the full scope of, of, of what the standard actually is. It's not just the letter of the Ten Commandments. But really, this all stems from him not having an uh, understanding or concept of union with Christ. Union with, with Christ makes no sense in a probationary model. Because God does not disown children that he adopts. And adoption is one of the many, many benefits that one receives by being in Christ. And again, like I said earlier, we've heard nothing really so far about the gospel. Remember, he said he's comparing two gospels within Adventism. He's really comparing two false gospels. But 
Then he said, sin is as constant as breathing. So that's a perfect example of what I was just saying is like, well, it's, it's a very, you're, it's a very caricatured understanding of what's being said by original sin, Dennis. It doesn't mean that literally every single second a person's either committing a lie, committing adultery. That's not what people are saying. That, that. And again, this gets back to the, the faulty understanding of man's actual disposition, that there's an actual issue by nature and why the born again experience is so much more than just, ah, it's Paul using like poetic, you know, or metaphorical language to sort of paint this sort of image in your mind. No, there's actually something going on in, in, in the nature or the being of the, the person. So I thought that was interesting. But did you notice how man-centered this supposed gospel is? And that's what he's painting Christianity as. He calls this the mainstream Christian gospel, but it's completely void of the full picture of what the Bible says regarding the born-again experience. I mentioned this earlier, being made a new creature in Christ, which again is a term of, of union with Christ. And the, their problem being this very narrow-sighted, low view of sin. Uh, notice he only listed, like you mentioned, you, you caught that as well. He only listed violations of the letter of the Ten Commandments. Yet the standard is loving God and neighbor perfectly in thought, word, deed, and motive, 24-7. But with a very narrow view of sin, it's easy to eclipse God's holiness, of which I heard nothing of in all of that. I heard nothing about the holiness of God. Even when he's going on about babies being born fallen in Adam, he didn't mention anything about the holiness of God. Exactly. And, you know, again, they have no concept of what it means to be dead in sin. I listened to this guy. I've listened to the majority of his messages, and I don't think I've ever heard him reference Ephesians chapter 2. And what it says about you were dead in trespasses and sins, but God made you alive in Christ. We were by nature children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. And yet he's arguing, you know, that Christ could have, Christ was essentially like us, is at the core of his message. Okay, okay. But we're, by nature, children of wrath. What does it mean, by nature? If Christ <laughs> had our nature, it, it just doesn't work. No. It doesn't work. Well, and like Why you mentioned, that there's a term there of uh, referring to union with Christ. We were uh, made alive together with him. In him, we were made alive together. So... Yeah, it really all stems from a uh, faulty understanding of union with Christ. But really, thus far, he hasn't gotten to the Adventist gospel, which will be the, the more interesting aspect here. Uh, I'm just going to continue harping on this. We haven't heard the gospel yet. So I, I'm waiting, Dennis, for your presentation of, of the gospel and not systematic theology and points of, of that. All right, as we begin to uh, travel up the tree, we come to the last point of this gospel. If all of that is true, if we are sinning by nature until Jesus comes, forget the talk of perfection. It is not going to happen in this life. It will wait until Jesus comes. Uh, perfection of character is something that is dangerous, something that we should not be focusing on, something that is not relevant to us today. All right, now this gospel that I've been describing is the orthodox mainstream gospel of the Christian churches today. It has been for centuries. This is mainstream orthodox Christianity. If you've ever watched those great scenes in the great uh, sports arenas where a, an evangelist of renown gives a call to, G, to, to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and hundreds, hundreds stream up to the front and kneel before the, thro before the altar, this is the gospel they're responding to. This is the gospel of Christianity. Now, this gospel has been impinging on the Seventh-day Adventist church for the past 30 to 40 years. And so there are fruits that are being born within the Seventh-day Adventist church. Okay. So, how would you, Richard, how would you rate his presentation so far of the Orthodox mainstream gospel well 
he said nothing of what we would say as mainstream Orthodox Christians that the gospel is. I've heard nothing about Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. I have heard nothing about him living for us, paying for our sins, dying in our place, or any of that that, you know, we would describe as being part of the gospel. We've just heard this systematic on, on sin and nature and so forth. But, you know, we've heard nothing of how we would biblically define the gospel as Christians. Yeah, I heard nothing about the person and work of Christ, which is the good news. Yeah. Uh, he equates easy believism with the gospel. So he points to like the Billy Graham revivals, you know, like a, like 20th century American revivalism. That's mainstream Christianity. That's the mainstream gospel. This sort of like get your ticket punched, get out of hell free card if you say a prayer type idea. Um, and he, he proves in, in that as well that when Adventists hear the real gospel, this is why they're flabbergasted. Because what he thinks is mainstream Christianity is just Western 20th century novelty that he says um, has, has influenced Adventism and has caused a rift. That's why I called this an SDA quasi-Christian hybrid gospel. This is what I get SDAs constantly telling me that I believe when what this guy presented tonight is two false gospels, or he's going to get into the second one here, by comparing and contrasting them, and the one that's supposed to be the Christian gospel is a caricature. Now he's going to talk about the fruits of this supposed gospel on SDA theology. So the tree trunk is supposed to be the gospel, and then the branches are supposed to be the fruit. So this is now the fruit of this mainstream Orthodox Christian gospel on Seventh-day Adventism in some pockets of Adventism. The judgment that we believe began in 1844. Judgment? Why do we need a judgment? Judgment, that's opposite to the gospel. The gospel is love and forgiveness and mercy. Judgment is arbitrary and harsh and negative. If you've accepted Jesus, you're saved. And this judgment issue is very simple. Uh, in this gospel, you don't need a judgment. All you need is a good recording angel secretary who writes in the record books of heaven, saved January 25, 1994, checks down the record book, still accepts Jesus, still saved. That's the only issue. Have you accepted Jesus, and do you still accept Jesus? What do you need a judgment for? Are you going to judge Sabbath keeping? No. Are you going to judge tithe returning? No. Those are sanctification issues. And that's why, in many minds, the justification, uh, the, the judgment that began in 1844 is not only irrelevant, but negative to the gospel, contradicts the gospel, destroys the gospel, makes light of the cross of Calvary. And so there has been much opposition to this judgment beginning in 1844. Okay, so again, this is supposed to be the orthodox mainstream Christian gospel. Still nothing about the person and work of Christ. Gives us a lot of systematic theology, but it isn't the gospel. But did you notice he equivocates between, even though he's misrepresenting, and say, well, and he's, he's trying to say, this is the way that some Adventists have tried to take this American or, or Christian mainstream gospel and have tried to bring it into Adventism and do like a hybrid sort of thing. But did you notice that he equivocates between judgment entirely and the investigative judgment? He said in this gospel, which this is supposed to be the mainstream Christian gospel, you don't need a judgment. Except, you know, uh, the Apostles Creed. I mean, seriously, it's like the six year olds getting catechized at my church can tell you this. It's like base level Christianity. It's just silly to say that Christians don't believe in any kind of judgment. That's negative. That's harsh. That's well, right. I mean, everyone, has, you know, every Orthodox Christian confesses the doctrine in the Apostles Creed, you know, he he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. You know, that's a universal 
belief. And yet the investigative judgment is entirely a unique novelty only found in Adventism. And yet we're to believe that if we reject this 19th century novelty, that we don't believe there's any kind of a judgment when that's what our forefathers in the faith have confessed for 2,000 years. Again, yeah, it's just the straw manning. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, what are you talking about? The, the mainstream Christian gospel, which, again, we, we, we haven't heard anything about the person and work of Christ, but he's, what he means when he says gospel is the whole system of theology. That's, that's what they think the gospel is, because that's how it is in Adventism. It's this big convoluted system of theology. So that's what he's trying to say, is that mainstream Christians don't even have a concept of judgment. It's like, Dennis, have you even read? I mean, it's like the most foremost Christian, you know, summation document in the world. It, it transcends continent. It's, it's just like, it's one of the oldest Christian documents. It's like foundational base level Christianity. But again, let's reference the Westminster Confession just because, again, we could refer to a number of them just to explore this supposed point. What does it say of the last judgment? <clears throat> Is it anything like, like Dennis claims? You don't need a judgment. The mainstream Christian gospel, their theology, they don't have a judgment. Quote, God hath appointed a day wherein he will judge the world in righteousness by Jesus Christ, to whom all power and judgment is given of the Father, in which day not only the apostate angels will be judged, but likewise all persons. But likewise, all persons that have lived upon the earth shall appear before the tribunal of Christ to give an account of their thoughts, words, and deeds, and to receive according to what they have done in the body, whether good or evil. The end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect and in his justice in the damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient. For then shall the righteous go into everlasting life and receive that fullness of joy and refreshing which shall come from the presence of the Lord. But the wicked who know not God and not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast into eternal torments and punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So this was just one example of many. He talks as though Christians don't believe in any sort of judgment. I've often heard them say that if you don't understand the, like, it, it, they don't understand that if the investigative judgment isn't true, there's no need for a judgment, like he said. They think it's because because God needs to vindicate his character, which becomes a, again, man-centered thinking. He's beholden to the creation, ultimately. What we read in the confession is God-centered. It's not about God vindicating his character. That was done at the cross. Not just where an atoning sacrifice took place, by the way. God's judgment is about demonstrating his character, not about vindicating it. It's about God. Jesus Christ is going to execute this judgment as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, having all authority to throw the wicked out of his kingdom. And notice, who does the confession properly recognize? That's done to. To yeah. those that do not obey the gospel. So not disparaging obedience either. <laughs> the other straw man we always hear. Thoughts on that, Richard, before I continue? Well, just to clarify, the confession didn't just pull that out of thin air. That's a direct quote from 2 Thessalonians 1 that says, When the Lord Jesus returns in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel. And yep. so that's, you know, that's totally a quote straight out of the Bible that it's those who do not obey the gospel that are going to be sentenced to eternal destruction, as it says in the passage. <clears throat> and so, says, what's that? No, go ahead. Oh, and uh, I lost my thought there. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that, and that's why understanding the law gospel distinction is so important. Exactly. But, you know, again, 
there's all these conflations in Adventism. And as I mentioned earlier, conflating justification, sanctification, glorification, melding everything together, also melding law and gospel yeah. together. And as I recall, as I listened to this presentation multiple times, he even, even mentioned that God would put nothing in the Bible if it wasn't salvational. And yeah. so there's a mentality that every single thing in the Bible is, is directly tied to reconciliation with God, to yeah. being saved. Yeah, we will see that um, toward the, the end of, of this. But folks, I want you to remember, he's misrepresenting mainstream Orthodox Christianity and saying this is what has influenced certain Adventists who then try and take it and filter it through the great controversy worldview. Because at the end of the day, that is what binds Seventh-day Adventists, regardless of which of these two Gospels they affirm. Because Dennis still has a uniting element with people who affirm this. There's still things that unite Dennis to those individuals, even if he's saying that's a false gospel. There are still things that unite them, and it's because of your great controversy worldview. Now he's going to talk about steps to Christ. Also, Ellen G. White and the Spirit of Prophecy, issues relating to that in the Seventh-day Adventist <clears throat> Church. I'm going to share a letter that came in from Seventh-day Adventists to Andrews University. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? An outstanding question. How do we keep our teenagers in touch with Christ? For starters, Deep Six, Messages to Young People and all other compilations, there is not a shred of gospel in the lot. Number two, stop publishing Steps to Christ, which is simply another works approach to salvation. Steps to Christ, you heard me right. That's not great controversy, is it? Sometimes we're a little fearful that that might be too strong for some people. But Steps to Christ, of all the writings that Ellen White ever wrote, isn't that the one you feel most easy, is the easiest to give to someone else? A simple statement of how we approach Jesus Christ as our Savior. How could that be such a negative factor in their minds? To understand that, I'm going to take you back to the year 1950, when a gentleman by the name of Barnhouse, who would later come in contact with Seventh-day Adventist leaders, the editor of Eternity Magazine, a very popular Christian magazine at that time, received a copy of Steps to Christ from somewhere, and he decided to review it in his magazine. Let me share with you what, is, what he said. He said, the book is false in all its parts. It bears the mark of the counterfeit from the first page. It contains satanic error. And I'm going to remind you again, that was Steps to Christ he was reviewing. Do you begin to see what the problem really is? The book Steps to Christ, which describes the way of salvation and how we approach Christ, is diametrically opposite to the gospel that we have been reviewing. It talks about surrender, it talks about commitment, and it even gets into that dreaded word obedience, which is so negative in this gospel's understanding. And so here was a very influential Christian editor that saw the book Steps to Christ as very dangerous if you want to understand how salvation works. And apparently that's where this letter kind of comes from that attitude that steps to Christ is not a correct understanding of the way of salvation. Questions about Ellen White's writings? Okay, Richard, is steps to Christ an accurate depiction of how one comes to Christ? No, and as I was listening to that, I remember reading an article at one time written by an Adventist, and it was actually in response, I think it was in response to Morris Venden, because Morris Venden had a story of, well, what am I going to do to get saved? And the story goes that he read Steps to Christ and came up with Bible study, prayer, and witnessing. But, and I can't remember the name of who wrote the article, but the particular article I read this one time pointed out there's just dozens of things in Steps to Christ that you are supposed to do in order to get yourself saved. In addition to, you know, faith, there's all these works listed in the book. Yeah, well, Barnhouse's statement is exactly right. That's why he said yeah. that. 
not because it's diametrically opposed to your like 20th century Western American, like church, you know, that period of the church's history, like caricature of the whole. Um, but how's about the plagiarism? He talks about rejecting steps to Christ for all the wrong reasons. It could be because the theology is indeed wrong and the writings are stolen. So folks on our website, again, check this out for yourselves. Let's look at it. You can come under the plagiarism section here and you can see for yourself. Let's look at some of these. I mean, Steps to Christ is one of the biggest, and it's not even that big of a book either. So the amount of plagiarism that there is is just crazy. Let's look at it. Color coordinated for you to see. This is page 13 of Steps to Christ. The Father loves us not because of the great propitiation, but he provided the propitiation because he loves us. Christ was the medium through which he could pour out his infinite love upon a fallen world. Then we have John Harris's, the great teacher, you know, written 60 some years before. Quote, the father loves us, not in consequence of the great propitiation, but that he provided the propitiation because he loved us, because he was bent on obtaining a medium through which he could pour out the ocean fullness of his love upon us. Again, the same book. Steps to Christ, next page, page 14, but the same book, John Harris is the great teacher. Therefore doth my father love me, because he quotes the, the scripture there, and they both quote the, the scripture. In becoming your substitute and surety, by surrendering my life, by taking your liabilities, your transgressions, I am endeared to my father. John Harris, he quotes the same, same scripture. He gives a little rendition there. In other words, my father loves you with a love so, un, uh, so unbounded that even loves me the more for dying to redeem you by sustaining your liabilities, by surrendering my life as an equivalent for your transgressions. The father loves me. I mean, folks, you can go through that. Look at this. This is all steps to Christ, steps to Christ, various authors. I mean, go, this is literally just the steps to Christ section and it's color coordinated for you. Sometimes she changes up the, the, the paragraph order, et cetera. There's no credit given to these authors in any of these books. So Dennis, maybe that's why people also reject Steps to Christ. I mean, there's a variety of reasons why people could reject it. But like you you pointed out, Richard, it teaches a false way to, to, to Christ. Not just that, it teaches a false Christ, technically. So not just exactly. that, it's, it's steps to a false Christ. And it's not even the correct steps to Christ. So, and I don't want to, I don't want to miss either his his implication that Barnhouse was down on obedience to God and by extension, all evangelicals, I mean, just insanity. I mean, you can find Barnhouse's materials on YouTube and Barnhouse is clearly not opposed to obedience. What he's opposed to is obedience for reconciliation with God. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. This unlawful use of the law. Not understanding and, obedience is not a reconciliation tool. Exactly. Not understanding the order that the Apostle Paul puts it in, in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, that we are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. And then following that, we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Notice, saved occurs past tense, and once we are saved, then God has created us to do good works in Christ Jesus, which he has ordained beforehand that we should walk in them, it says. And yeah, so the problem, yeah, the problem is not obedience. The problem is Adventism making obedience a reconciliation tool, making it you do this, or again, you know, God is going to punitively yank it from you. Yeah. And we'll see some quotes later on that, because when he starts talking about Adventist justification and sanctification, where he's like, Adventists believe in both justification and sanctification. And it's like, what in, What do you mean? Like acting like the, the mainstream Christian gospel doesn't believe in uh, sanctification either. So I'll save my comments for that when we get to that point. The law, the Ten Commandments, Seventh-day Adventists say that the law was not nailed to the cross, that, we, that it is for us today. But yet, how does that work? If we're sinners by nature, we're sinning constantly, which means, if I read my Bible right, sin is the transgression of what? 
the law. So it means we're breaking the law constantly. How can you have a law that you're breaking constantly as anything meaningful at all? So questions arise about the law. And there, of course, is the Sabbath, right in the middle of the law. How can we make that central if every Sabbath keeper is a lawbreaker 100% of the time? And Sabbath keeping is still impossible if the law can't be kept. Up to the top of the tree, health health issues. Well, that is obviously sanctification. That's not justification. So if, that, if sanctification is not part of the gospel, then how can health be that important? I'm going to read a couple of statements on this point. God's salvation is so extravagant, so comprehensive, that it can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. Did you catch that again? Can't be increased or diminished by what we eat, drink, or wear. Exercise and a good diet contribute to a long and useful life, but they don't add to our salvation. Well, let's not make such a big issue of it. Why is that? It may not be so important as we thought it was. After all, it's a sanctification, not a justification issue. It's not a salvation issue. Okay. So... Perfect demonstration how a truncated view of sin leads to a truncated view of the law. Comments on that? Well, the whole thing about the law being nailed to the cross, again, that is not orthodox Christianity. Show me one historic creed or confession from any denomination that has the law being nailed to the cross. And as we've discussed before, this whole concept of the law nailed to the cross is really based on a faulty translation from Colossians chapter 2. What was actually nailed to the cross was our sin debt, not the law. Yeah, and I'm going to save my comments on that just because he goes into that more later, and so I'll bring up some more about that then. But yeah, it's just like, oh my goodness, man, like don't don't say the the mainstream Christian because by gospel he means teaching. So we need because again he uh, spoiler alert folk, folks he's never going to present the gospel. He never gets into the gospel because by the word gospel he's using that synonymously for system of theology or you know a, a, a certain teaching and he's going to say like you mentioned earlier that um, if God revealed it it's a salvation issue. Um, and so we'll we'll get to that then. But it's just show me the mainstream Christian confession that says that you're responding to like bad arguments from 20th century Western Christendom um, where there were people who, you know, individuals saying these sorts of things, but you're not going to find a mainstream Christian confession that's saying the law was nailed to the cross. Um, it's just, they love that. And so if you're, a, if you're a former Adventist, if you're trying to engage with Adventists, please do not use that argument. I'll bring up uh, something later in, in regards to that, but Something else is being said there, and it actually completely destroys Adventism because it destroys the investigative judgment in 1844 if you understand what's actually being said in Colossians 2. There's other places to go to in Scripture to talk about not being under the law covenantally. All right, but now he's going to go into standards. So remember, we're still in the fruit here of this mainstream Orthodox Christian gospel that's influenced Seventh-day Adventist pastors. The fruit now into how it's impacted the view of standards in Seventh-day Adventism. And then standards. Now I'm talking about all the standards of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, our entertainment, and yes, even the clothes we wear. All of the standards of the Adventist Church. Obviously, once again, that's sanctification. That's not justification. And so that can't be as important as we thought it was. Another statement that I found. Members give assent to various standards and rules as a condition of membership in the organization, we need to keep in mind that this assent is not related to their salvation, only to being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now watch that, that little bit of logic right there. We ask people not to, we ask people if they want to become a Seventh-day Adventist to lay aside tobacco and alcohol. But that is not part of the Seventh-day Adventist way of life. Now why do we do that? 
According to this, it's because that's simply one of the rules of the Adventist church. Any group, any church has rules. And if you want to be a card-carrying member of that church or organization, you abide by those rules. But you understand that's not relevant to salvation. The smoking and drinking issue is a rule of the church, not a salvation issue at all, according to this bit of logic. Another person said it this way, Though I believe something to be correct from a religious perspective, it is not a matter of salvation. You may have been hearing that quite a bit in recent years. This isn't a matter of salvation. That isn't a matter of salvation because of this particular emphasis. Anything which is not part of justification is not a matter of salvation in this gospel. Okay. So, Richard, thoughts on that? Well, Dennis has spilled the beans, and that is that every little thing is an issue of salvation in Adventism. Yep. All of the dozens and hundreds of standards and rules that really they come from Ellen White, because you can't find them in the scripture, are all salvational issues. They're all required if you're going to be saved in the end, if you're going to make it through this close of probation period. And again, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for his candidness that this is really how it is, regardless of what the, the public relations wing of Adventism will say, the reality that thousands and hundreds of thousands and even millions of Adventists have lived is everything is a salvational issue and a failure to do something that you know you should be doing from an Adventist point of view is, is potentially damning you. And the thing that's so interesting about this standards topic, well, there's actually two things here. It's interesting because these Adventists that he's pointing at, it's like they're correct in, in one sense that, yeah, those things are not the gospel. Exactly. However, the, they're still these people tend to still have a great controversy worldview. And so that then clouds everything else. But uh, and nevertheless, he, he gives a, a great insight into how this is one of those topics. I haven't done videos on it yet, but we will be um, They're like the temperance doctrines and, and Christian behavior and that sort of stuff is one of those areas, man, that I think most former Adventists can relate with because it's this false, like you mentioned, all this stuff that Ellen White put together. And that is then branded as being Christ-like. So if you're outside of this sort of like, uh, you know, um, manufactured perfect image of what has like what a Christian is supposed to be, well, you're in sin. And so it becomes this whole like, you know, there's this uh, this sort of perfect depiction of what the Adventist is supposed to be. And that's the mark you're supposed to be aiming for. And that stuff is salvational. That's why I'll talk with former SDAs who will be like, I remember I, they will say, I remember I used to see people with jewelry and my thought would be, well, they're definitely not saved. They're not serious. They're not a serious Christian. They're wearing makeup and jewelry. Look how tight those clothes are. It gets into that sort of stuff. And obviously when you say anything about this, their visceral response is typically, oh, so you're saying that it doesn't, they just jump to this other extreme because everything has to be this false binary. Um, I just think that's interesting, though, how he he very clearly is laying out like he was saying the clothes you wear. Your salvation yeah. hinges upon the clothes that you wear. And again, like I said, they're going to then respond and be like, so you think people can wear whatever? No, you're missing the point entirely. <laughs> that's not what I'm saying at all. That's not what I'm saying at all. If that's your response, oh, man, uh, God bless you. But all right, now he's going to transition into what he calls his own convictions. So now he's kind of wrapping this up before we transition into what he claims is the real gospel, where he's going to go into a lot more detail on things. All right. So what we've looked at is the mainstream gospel of the Christian church and some of its impacts on Seventh-day Adventist doctrines and lifestyle. So here is where I'm going to share with you my convictions. I believe that this gospel left to grow and flourish left to become the mainstream gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church will destroy Seventh-day Adventism. We are in a life and death struggle here. 
This is not simply an interpretation of prophecy by which we can have differing opinions and come out okay in the end. This is whether or not we are in heaven with Jesus Christ for all eternity and whether Seventh-day Adventism has any future at all as God's remnant church. This is the heart and soul of religion. At least he says it like it is. Doesn't yeah. beat around the bush. Adventism is most certainly not Christian. It is not Christianity. Not that he presented Christianity accurately there, but his point is true nonetheless. He said, did you notice in there, he said you can disagree on prophecy? He was like, it's not like a prophecy where, you know, you can disagree. What prophecies can you disagree with in Adventism and come out okay in the end? Well, history shows that when Adventist pastors do that, particularly a certain prophecy on 1844, it goes very badly for them. <laughs> and so, yeah. you know, this idea that, you know, there are things you can disagree on in Adventism that are Adventist teaching, that's really not the case. Now, what's interesting is though you can't disagree on prophecy, you can be all over the map on the nature of Jesus Christ or the nature of I know. God. I know. It's, it's just crazy. astounding. But yet, 1844, you know, you got to get that right or bye-bye uh, to you. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about his Christology. I don't know what he would say about those types, but I would be curious to know if he would have as strong of a stance. Can somebody be an Aryan heretic, Dennis, in your ranks? And, and then be in alignment with all this other stuff that you said. Because he said nothing about Christology, you know, none of that. So I'd be curious to know if somebody who affirms that, if he would embrace, because that would be even more telling. But I'm just thinking, dude, I don't know any prophecies in Adventism that you can disagree with. Uh, maybe the, all the false prophecies <laughs> that are universally well, disagreed with. <laughs> yeah, and of course, there's all the the prophecies in Scripture that they just ignore. Yeah, I think we've talked about this before amongst ourselves, that they do a Revelation seminar, and really it's certain chapters of Revelation that they're presenting, you know, chapter 12, 13, 14, 17, etc., but then skipping over the rest of it. And so again, it's this selective canon within a canon thing. Maybe there's some some things like that you're allowed to disagree on. But historically, yeah, any point. disagreement on these issues has generated intense heat and controversy within Adventism itself. Yeah, because the whole system is basically built on prophecy. Okay, now he's going to folks, they won't all be these short little bursts like this. These are just kind of how he had stuff broken up. So now he's going to get into uh, predestination. Did, did you notice at the bottom of the tree, there's a long word called predestination. The reason for that is when this gospel was first being developed in the third and fourth centuries, everyone believed in predestination. God decides who's saved and lost. You don't have a voice in the matter. And for a thousand years, that was the belief of most Christians, that we are either destined for heaven or destined for hell with no choice in the matter. And what is very interesting is that although predestination has been dropped by most Christians, the gospel built on predestination is still the mainstream gospel. And if you look at it, it kind of fits. We're born sinners because of bad equipment. Jesus didn't sin because he had good equipment. We're forgiven for our bad equipment until Jesus comes. And then at Jesus coming, I guess Jesus is going to push a magic button in our brains and we won't sin anymore. In other words, bad equipment, sin, good equipment, no sin. End of discussion. Kind of fits with predestination. How is his presentation of predestination? Well, first of all, it just it jumped out at me. The whole, you have no choice in the matter. You know, you're either destined for life or damnation. And what I tell people is somebody who does believe in the doctrine people typically think of as, as predestination, that God has chosen us to be in Christ before the foundation of the world. What I typically tell people is right now in real time, 
If you want to be predestined, if you want to be elect, put your faith in Jesus Christ and you will. But you can also have the comfort that if you do that, that this was not some accident, this was not some afterthought, that God has chosen you in him before the foundation of the world. The other thing I would say is that Adventists present this false dichotomy that you either believe in predestination or you don't. And really, that's not the issue. The issue is, how do you understand predestination? Because predestination is a scriptural word. We find it in Romans 8.30. We find it in, yeah, there you go, uh, what we'd call the golden chain of salvation. Those whom he predestined, he also called, as it says in verse 30. In addition to that, we also find the word explicitly used in Ephesians 1. And so it's not a question of whether or not, as people who take the Bible seriously, we can believe in predestination. It's how we're going to understand it. And obviously, amongst true Christian believers, there's different understandings of that. But we can't just discard the concept and say it's unbiblical because it clearly appears in the Bible. Took the words right out of my mouth. That's why I already had it brought up. Um, Sorry, Dennis. It's there. (laughs) It's part of the chain of salvation. You can't just outright dismiss it. This is typically where SDAs are going to falsely assert that's Calvinism. As though John Calvin novelly came up with predestination. Um, No, no. Right. You can't just whole cloth throw something out. There's been discussions around the mechanics of that, etc. But he's sort of presenting this idea of like, well, it's not even a thing at all. I mean, except it's literally part of the chain of salvation. But I want to note before getting into his, his next portion here, we still haven't actually heard the gospel. I've heard a lot of theological disagreements, but not the gospel. Remember that, folks. Now, I think we will all agree that the heart and soul of the way God saves is not predestination, but instead it is free choice. And based on free choice, a completely different gospel develops. Sin, what is sin? Sin in this gospel is not an accident of birth. Sin is not having bad equipment inside. Sin is not simply being a child of Adam and Eve. Sin in this gospel is simply this. When you know the difference between right and wrong, and you deliberately choose what is wrong, you become a sinner, a lost, condemned sinner in the eyes of God when you know what is right and deliberately choose to defy that and do it your own way. And yes, we've all done that. But the key issue, how do we become that way? In this gospel, by making a choice, not just by being born. All right, based on that, Jesus Christ, when he comes down to this earth, he can take my bad equipment and not be a sinner. So now we must investigate what the Bible teaches on this subject. And we'll talk about that as we go on in our study. But in this gospel, Jesus Christ can take my fallen nature because that is not sin. And he chose to not follow that fallen nature during his entire life. Therefore, he was sinless. So the equipment did not disqualify him. It would have been disloyalty that would have disqualified him as our Savior. And so in this gospel, Jesus Christ can take my nature. Now we come up to the crucial point again, justification. But you notice that in this gospel, justification and sanctification are included, not just one or the other. And right here is the crucial difference between these two gospels. I want to try to refer. So according to Dennis, predestination and free will are the gospel message. Very poor understanding of predestination because he thinks it means, like she said, pe- people don't make choices or have the capacity to do so. He sets up a false dichotomy of what sin is again. It's only, see, in this gospel, it's it's behavioral. So, well, Dennis, it can be both. It's not mutually exclusive. The behavior is the fruit of a condition, which is, again, why you need to look at the whole of Scripture on a subject. The Bible has a lot more to say, folks, than just 1 John 3 regarding what sin is. It's not just, I mean, even Jesus' teaching on the law was not just the letter of the law. He expounds upon it, the spirit behind it. There's a deeper implication going on there. When he talks about 
It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of his heart. Again, he's talking about these internal issues that run a lot deeper than merely the letter of the law. Um, is this the gospel, Richard, so far? No, nope, still haven't heard it. No. And any thoughts that you have on that? Well, I was just on the on the last thing. I was just thinking it's interesting the presentation of of um, free choice as though people are in this neutral state where they just take it or leave it. Again, it's it's a deficient view of the nature of man. It's not understanding, as Paul says, that the natural man doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God, and he regards them as foolishness. It's a failure to understand what it means to be dead in trespasses and sins. It's a failure to understand what it means to be a slave to sin. And so there's this concept that people are just walking around, and if you just hear a good presentation that if they just hear that they'll embrace it and of course we know that that doesn't that's not how it works out oftentimes and that's Adventists know that too but the assumption is there's just this desire in there to embrace God and to embrace the gospel and embrace the truth and Again, it's just assumed. It's not built from the scripture on what the nature of man really is. Yeah, and like I said, I'll have comments on that here in a moment because when he again when, how he's transitioning into theirs, um, he'll he'll bring that up here in a minute. So I'll save my comments for there. Your memory again on the first gospel, the Christian gospel. Justification is one hundred percent Christ's own perfect work done for us. Sanctification follows 50-50 as a cooperative work, I work, and God works. So that's the key point of the first gospel. Justification, 100% Christ's work. Sanctification, 50% Christ's work. Now, let's take a look at that very carefully, because that is the key difference between these two understandings of salvation. Is justification... 100% Christ's work. Yes, you're exactly right. It is. It is. There is no other way of salvation ever known to mankind except Jesus Christ. But are there some things you must believe and do to participate in this perfect work of Christ for us? Let's get very basic right now. Do you have to take this book as more than a collection of 66 interesting stories. You have to believe that it actually is the product of God's mind sharing His will with us directly as if He were here talking to us. Is that a big step of faith? I mean, there are a lot of books in this world. There are other holy books, the Koran, etc., and you're believing that this book is the only way that God has chosen to speak His will to mankind? Wow, that's a big step of faith. Tucked away about two-thirds of the way in this book is a story of one who came down from heaven, lived for over 30 years on this earth without even sinning once, and then at the end of his life experience, he died as a criminal, and his death as a criminal is the way of salvation for anyone who accepts him as personal Savior. You have to believe that too? You talk about a bigger step of faith than even believing that this book is God's voice. Those are huge steps of faith that you have to make a decision about. Amen. Once you've done that, once you've accepted Jesus Christ and the story in the Bible, in the New Testament, then do you have to repent of a past way of life that has not been so good? Do you have to say, I'm sorry the way I've messed things up? If there is someone you have wronged, if there is someone you have uh, misled, hurt their reputation, do you have to go to that person and humbly say, I'm sorry from what I did to you? Confess our sins personally. Okay, so there's the first at least inkling mention of anything to do with the person and work of Christ. And we are uh, almost 30 minutes in. 
But while he's presenting the Christian gospel, he didn't mention any of that stuff. He mentioned a bunch of stuff about systematics. Richard, any thoughts on that before moving to the next section? Well, the whole 50-50 thing on sanctification. <sighs> he's going to mention that again. <laughs> but uh, I was just thinking, so obviously he regards sanctification as 100% of God. And I would agree with that, although I think I'd have a different definition of sanctification than he does, because he defines it as all these things that we're doing. But I just want to know how that computes, that he mentions all these things we have to do, but then says it's 100% of God. How does that go together? <laughs> well, it do well, it doesn't. And we're going to look at some quotes later from his prophetess that show it doesn't. Um, but you'll see here in a moment, folks, why he's wanting to uh, position it that way. Do you have to make a complete 100% surrender of your life to Jesus Christ? Well, those are all big steps, aren't they? Not easy steps. Let's say for a moment that you do all those things. You believe the Bible, you believe Jesus Christ, you, uh, you repent, you confess your sins, you surrender your life. And for just a moment, imagine with me that Jesus never really did die on the cross, that that didn't happen. How, far, how much is all of that going to get you? Zero, is that right? So yes, Jesus Christ, the only way of salvation is 100% Jesus' death on the cross, isn't it? That is the key issue. And right here, most Christians do not understand what I'm going to share with you next. There is a difference between the cause of salvation and the conditions of salvation. Most Christians don't want to hear about conditions. Conditions of salvation. The cause of salvation is the grace of God and the life and death of Jesus Christ. That's the cause of salvation. There is no other cause. But there are conditions to participating in that 100% work of Jesus Christ. And we've just gone through a few of those. Big steps of faith. Big decisions about your life. Those are conditions. They don't earn you salvation. They don't get you salvation. You don't deserve salvation because you have done those things. But without those things, you can't be saved. And that Christians find a hard time getting their minds around. They, don't, they say, well, then that's works. No, it isn't work in the sense of human works because the only salvation is Jesus Christ. But the only way to participate in that is cooperation. That's the word. Cooperation with God's way. If this is the way, Lord, then I want to participate in it. Not to deserve anything, but because this is the way you have outlined. If I'm to be baptized, that doesn't earn me my salvation, but I want to participate in the way you have suggested that I come into a new birth experience. And so all of these conditions of salvation are the key issues right here. It's just the way God's outlined, Richard. That's just how God's outlined the way to be saved. That's all. Dennis, Thoughts on that? your list, Dennis, is way longer than what I read in the Bible. I think of Romans 4, 5. To him who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. I think of the Philippian jailer and falling down and saying to the apostles, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Not some long list of conditions is given to them. He is told, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And so, Dennis, where's all your conditions in the scripture? The scripture says faith alone. Well, and having a system of salvation is novel to the 19th century. Yet that's how God outlines salvation happens. <laughs> I mean, Dennis, your church is on record saying that your guys' gospel message is novel to you guys. They literally have people, J.L. Schuler in the 30s, reviewing Herald, saying, this gospel message that we have, which is what he's putting forth tonight, was not preached by the apostles, the church fathers, the medieval fathers, the reformers, no one else, only them. But that's how God has outlined salvation. Mm, I'm sensing some present truth here with uh, going on in, in Dennis's way of, of seeing things. Okay, now he's going to move into 
Sabbath keeping. Let's um, take it another step. Sanctification. Remember, the first gospel says that's 50% Christ's work and 50% my work. Let's take Sabbath keeping as an example. Let's say you're very careful about your Sabbath keeping, that you precisely end your business activities before sundown on Friday evening. You do not carry business into the Sabbath. You have a good Friday evening experience with the Lord. On Sabbath morning, you are in church. Sabbath afternoon, you are doing work for the Lord. You close the Sabbath on Friday evening, on Sabbath evening. Does that make you a Sabbath keeper? And I'm going to say, no, it doesn't. It makes you a Saturday keeper. Who are the best Saturday keepers this world has ever known? The Pharisees. I mean, they were very careful. They had rules for everything. They were not going to break the Sabbath under any condition in any way. They were going to make sure that they had boundaries all the way around the Sabbath so the Sabbath holiness could not be touched. And you know what? Jesus had to spend an inordinate amount of his ministry trying to turn Saturday keepers into Sabbath keepers. So what's a Sabbath keeper? Some people in the Christian world, misidentify us. They get our name wrong. They call us seven-day Adventists. Have you heard that? You seven-day Adventists? They may be more right than we realize. Wow. If we aren't an Adventist, a Christian, on Tuesday, you can forget about the Sabbath as a holy day. If we aren't a Christian seven days out of the week, then there is no Sabbath keeping possible for us, only Saturday keeping. He mentions the Pharisees. Dennis, y y you mean like this? Folks, you can go to the site, type this in. What did Ellen White add to the Sabbath command? I mean, look at all these. Those are just the ones that I've documented. There's probably more than that. Now, they'll respond, like I, I say in the article here, they'll, they'll respond to this rank legalism by claiming context in which Ellen White lived was different. Many of these tasks, they required tons of labor, and it would keep one from resting, yada, yada. But the point being, the Pharisees, Dennis, that, that's literally what you guys are. That is what you guys are. Thoughts on that? And did you, did you catch where he said Jesus spent his ministry trying to make Saturday keepers into Sabbath keepers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, what? 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 Again, their whole system, though, of course, revolves around the seventh day Sabbath, you know. And yeah, so, great controversy theme. Right, you know, it's the end time testing truth. It's the thing that God is supposedly so concerned about above, above all others. And yet Christ is said to have come to turn Saturday keepers into Sabbath keepers. I just want to know where this emphasis is in the Gospels. We have four Gospels. Where is this emphasis that that's what his ministry was trying to do was make Sabbath keepers out of the Pharisees. Well, and it's just one of those things. It's like, it's peak Adventism to say like these like pithy sort of things. Like these people said this comment about us. So they may be more right than we understand. Jesus's ministry was based on making Saturday keepers, Sabbath keepers. And it's like, Ooh, yeah, that really, you know, that's so insightful. But no, then you examine it and it's like, well, no. Well, what are you talking about? Jesus was rebuking people that had a bunch of man-made traditions, the Corban rule, for example, and was rebuking them for adding all of these additions and missing the greater point, which is exactly what Adventism has done. <laughs> like, almost identically so. Exactly. Because you see, the Sabbath is a holy day, isn't it? And how can an unholy person keep a holy day? That's impossible. And so only one who has been made holy by the process of sanctification can keep a holy day in any way. Who does the work of making someone holy? Holy Spirit? Jesus Christ? 
So the work of changing a person inwardly so that they reflect the image of Jesus Christ and are holy from the inside out is the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit. 100%? Yeah, 100%. You don't contribute to that. Do you have to cooperate with that? Are there conditions to that? So you see, we have conditions and cause again. Conditions of Sabbath keeping are stopping your work on Friday evening. But that does not make you holy. The work of holiness is bigger than that and precedes that. And so I'm going to say that the Christian gospel has made a tragic mistake when it says that the work of sanctification is 50% my work. No, it isn't. It's 100% Christ's work, God's work, the Holy Spirit's work. 100%, and we participate in it. I'm going to use another illustration right here to kind of uh, set this in perspective. Okay. Oh. All right. Did you notice the flip-flopping, specifically on the day being holy, but not really because it's only holy if the individuals leading up to it are holy and set apart? Previously said, or previously he said, if you aren't an Adventist on Monday, Tuesday, etc., you can forget about the Sabbath being a holy day. But then he says, the Sabbath is a holy day, isn't it? So how can an unholy person keep a holy day? Total uh, non-distinction of like, you got blundered up there, Dennis. But then this claim, like you mentioned earlier, the Christian gospel, is that sanctification is 50% man and 50% God? Dennis, where are you getting this? Earlier, he tried to make it sound like Christians don't think sanctification is really a thing at all. Now he says they do, but it's a 50-50 split. Again, let's just use the Westminster Confession as an example, since you and I align closest with that. Um, but again, we could look at others. Does this sound anything like he's claiming? Westminster Confession, Chapter 13 of Sanctification. They who are effectually called and regenerated, having a new heart and a new spirit created in them, are further sanctified, really and personally, through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by his word and spirit dwelling in them. The dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the several lusts thereof are more and more weakened and mortified, and they're more and more quickened and strengthened in all saving graces to the practice of true holiness, without which... No man shall see the Lord. This sanctification is throughout in the whole man, yet imperfect in this life. There abideth still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. In which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may, may much prevail, yet through the continual supply of the strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So they're sanctified by what? The word and the spirit of God. That's 100% God. So Dennis, you're wrong, sir. He said it's 100% God's work, but we participate in it. That sounds a lot closer to a 50-50 than what we just read. And what we read is actually 100% God's work, according to the confession. We could look at others, and we're going to talk about their view of sanctification a little bit more later, so I'll save my other comments for then. Richard, any thoughts that you have on that? Well, but, 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 because it mentions that there's still, you know, some abiding remnants of corruption in us in this life, why, that's not really full sanctification, don't you know? <laughs> right. If you can't achieve glorification now, it means that you don't think glorification will come at any point. But then again, they, they misdefine glorification. So that's where the, the issue rubs. But that's essentially what the confession is getting at there is that which we're going to look at that later as well. Um, what the confession has to say about glorification and that it's basically just stating when it says that not this idea. Oh, it's making a loophole for sin. That's what you'll hear. Oh, so it's making provisions to just live however you want. It's like this get out of jail free card type thing. No, that's not what it's doing. It's it's recognizing the timeline, like you said, that God has an order and they're trying to basically short circuit that. So now he's going to give an example of a testimony. And this is just 
this says it all. It says it all. Say in church, you come to church one day and you listen to a marvelous testimony. The person in church is giving a testimony of how Jesus has forgiven his sins, how he's having a good walk with the Lord. He prays, he studies his Bible, he's, he's out witnessing, he's doing things that really bring him happiness and joy and peace, and he just spends 10 minutes praising God for the work that God has done in his life, and you stand back amazed. I want that experience. I want to know how he's, getting, how, how he's doing that. I want to get, get acquainted with him. So one day you follow him home from church. And you notice a strange thing when he gets out of his car at his house. He's yelling at the kids. They must have ticked him off on the way home somehow, and that's not very good. So he's yelling at them and their faults. All the way up the sidewalk, he yells at the kids. His wife steps in to kind of blunt the force of his anger, and she gets the brunt of his anger as well. He's yelling at her too. And by the time they get to the front door, he's even pushed his wife. What do you think? Is there something wrong with that marvelous justification experience? Sanctification doesn't seem quite up to par, does it? Let's turn it around. Let's say there's a person in church who is a very careful Sabbath keeper, very careful in tithes and offerings, very careful in high standards, health reform, all of the things that make a lifestyle of an Adventist. But when you talk to that person, there is no joy in his heart. There is no peace. There is no happiness. He kind of hangs his head. And he says, I've got to do all these things because if I don't do them, I'm going to end up in hell and I don't want to go there. So I'm going to grit my teeth and I'm going to keep the Sabbath. What do you think? Is there something wrong with that experience? Sanctification looks good on the outside, doesn't it? But where is the justification? Where is the joy of forgiveness? Where is the happiness that comes from a living relationship with Jesus Christ? So what I'm saying is that these two, justification and sanctification, must work precisely in harmony with each other. They must be in cooperation if there is going to be any genuine salvation. It's not justification up here and sanctification as coming along for the ride. Justification is not the engine and sanctification the caboose. These are part and parcel of one saving process, and God does both of them while we cooperate with him and fulfill certain conditions. That's my understanding of how the gospel works, and that's what the difference, the primary difference between these two gospels. Justification in the first gospel is all that matters. In the second gospel, sanctification is as crucial as justification. Now, if God can justify us 100%, and if he can sanctify us 100%, then is it just remotely possible that God can perfect us 100%? And I said God can. That he can do the impossible. And so that last step in this gospel says perfection of character is possible before Jesus comes. Okay, there are so many issues with his example, which actually makes for a perfect example of how the SDA system has no concept of a person's war with sin. It had no understanding of nuance whatsoever. Dennis, what about if this person was remorseful after doing this? What if this person has been a born-again believer for one week and they're an infant in the faith? What about if that encounter leads to his wife reaching out to the elders? The elders then come and exercise church discipline. The man's remorseful and God uses it as a big boost in his walk with Christ and his sanctification. I mean, there's so many nuances to that. That's like, see, in their understanding, though, it's like, oh, see, any slip up, it's revoked. Like all of a sudden you have no, you're, you have no union with Christ. I guess some of them could say, well, that person never had union with Christ. OK, but the majority of them are going to say, well, that person in that moment, they became disowned because the Bible says union with Christ brings about holiness, blame, like you're holy, blameless, uh, set apart, you're redeemed. You're, I mean, there's so many things. And we've talked about this on the channel before, but one of those is adopted. So in Dennis's view, any little thing at any possible moment, God is just waiting and watching because apparently he's not all knowing either. That's the logical ends of this. They'd, he'd be an open theist if he was consistent. That God's just waiting and watching for any moment and any slip up, any, oh, it's revoked now. 
That's the sort of thing that's being presented there. And that was the testimony of I don't know how many Adventists I've talked to. That's exactly what they were presented with. That God is a figure where it, with the father has like steam pouring out of his ears and he's angry. And the son is kind of standing in between as the soft sort of passive figure that's trying to calm him down. And you just have this angry God who's just waiting to fly off the handle kind of at any moment. That's the sort of thing that he presented there. There's so much nuance in all that. That's like, dude, you, you are completely missing it. Like people war with sin. Yeah. There are sins that people struggle with for long periods of time. Sometimes the point is, is that they are warring with it. That's something that doesn't happen with the unbeliever. <laughs> the unbeliever doesn't war with sin. They don't have conviction of sin. And this does go back to, again, not the gospel, but his just faulty understanding of anthropology, the nature of man. Um, because he has no concept of that that war going on. But because of what he said, if that's even happening, any of that stuff he mentioned, you have a bunk testimony. You obviously haven't been changed because there could be still, still sins that you're at war with. Yet I know countless people early on that warred with certain sins by virtue of being born again and now having and now having conviction, they war with that particular sin and it lasts sometimes for a long time. But according to Dennis, that entire year that person was at war with that sin, they weren't actually a believer. They hadn't been 100% sanctified at the moment of accepting Christ type thing. What he described is pietism, not Christianity. Pietism. He said this person's reading their Bible, they're praying, they're out witnessing, doing things that bring them joy, etc. But then when you follow him home at his house, you see he exudes behavior that's not in line with those other things. That's literally just pietism. <laughs> just because somebody's doing those things, that's not what you look to to say, well, that person's a Christian because they are, because they are doing this and that, and they're reading their Bible each day. And, you know, if you, if you read your Bible this many times and you go to church this many times, all of that stuff gets into pietism. That's, that's not what automatically makes somebody a Christian, but it's a perfect insight into the Adventist understanding of what a testimony is they love having people. I don't know if the churches you were at, they love having people come and share your testimony because they want to have, hopefully some other person there will hear about how the Adventist message just radically changed their life. And it'll make people just fall in love with Adventism even more. Any thoughts on, on any of that? Well, there's no concept. I mean, there is a concept, but it's losing your salvation. There's no concept that God works with his people, that we are in his family. He is our father. And like a good father, you know, if my kids disobey me, I don't open the front door and boot them on the street. Um, you know, as the scripture says, as God says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Yeah, and so, too. yeah. And so, God is, it's not that, you know, there's just a get out of jail free card, so to speak, if we sin. The Lord does chastise. He does rebuke. The word is clear about that. But we're not going to be cast out. I mean, Dennis, what do you do with John 6, 37? The one who comes to me, I will never cast out. I mean, <laughs> and yet every time we sin in this system, we're going to be cast out. The other yeah, thing yeah. I thought about earlier, and I want to bring it up now, is we actually have a biblical example of a man who fell into heinous sin in David and how God dealt with that. God didn't cast him off to perish. God sent a messenger to David to bring him to a conviction of his sin and to bring him to repentance. And so we actually have an example of how this works. Can, can God's people, can saved people fall into heinous sin at times? Yes. But is God going to leave us there? No. Nope. God is going to draw us back to repentance. Yeah, and it it just apply the Psalms, the things that David says in the Psalms to this sort of thing that he's putting forth. All the times David and Asaph are lamenting over their sin. Well, that shouldn't be happening in the, the life of the, the believer, right? 
all Fire those me. different times they lamented and mourned over their sin and so all that's all those times was them just going back and forth back and forth god is just it, that's not a stable way of living that's not a stable way of understanding that's that's not like you said that's not what's going on because god chastises his children that said over and over in scripture did you notice that he associates sanctification with living the adventist lifestyle <laughs> which would include yeah. diet theology tithes seventh day sabbatarianism etc again getting this from ellen white thoughts on what he said regarding sanctification and justification well yeah i've been thinking about about what you mentioned you know the whole for some time now you know of associating sanctification with Adventist standards. I can tell my own personal testimony about that, as I'm sure others who have come out of Adventism can, that, you know, as clothing and and these other things he mentions, you know, jewelry and whatnot became less of an issue. Other things were becoming more and more of an issue. As an Adventist, I had no qualms about gossip for example. And as I learned the gospel, I was more and more convicted. In fact, I remember one day I was meeting with a, a Christian man and I was, I started gossiping about someone in the community. And this was right when I was in the transition point, transitioning from Adventism into the true gospel. And this man's response you know, I, I shared how this other person had had approached me in a red hot fury. And then, you know, as soon as I moved toward him, he backed off and apologized to me. And and, you know, my thought was, you know, well, he was he was afraid because he approaches me in this fury. And then I moved toward him and he doesn't even know me, this guy that did this. This was a neighbor scenario in a place I was working. But anyway, I told this story to this Christian man, and he immediately says, well, that's great. That guy apologized to you, and here I'm gossiping and thinking it's funny, and this, guy's, this guy was a lowlife to, to approach me in this rage and then back off from it. And yet it pricked me in the heart at that very moment about this behavior that I was perfectly comfortable with as an Adventist, you know, of just assuming these bad things about people, just airing people's dirty laundry to others who had nothing to do with it. And this Christian man's response of praise to the other man pricked me in the heart and convicted me over sins I had never even been convicted over before. Hmm. Yeah, well, it's like he's, again, like he was saying earlier, he's kind of alluding at the same thing here. It's like, well, Christians don't believe in sanctification. They demean it. It's like down here. It's not, it's like, Dennis, you're not dealing with the the issue, at least not historically. I, I, I don't know any movement historically. I, I mean, that's been orthodox. Right. <laughs> um, outside of orthodoxy, you can find anything. But within like orthodox Christian tea, I can't find anyone who just says, no, sanctification is not a thing. Again, we don't do the thing like Dennis does with, oh, predestination? That's that. No, that's not in the Bible. Just throw that out entirely. We're not doing that with sanctification. The, the problem is, is rightly understanding its, its function, its use, its category, that sort of thing. But all of that to say, folks, this is what they actually teach. He's not getting into the finer details, but this is what they teach about sanctification and justification. Okay? It's from Ellen White's Faith and Works, page 99. We've looked at this before. Quote, while God can be just and yet justify the sinner through the merits of Christ, no man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. God requires the entire surrender of the heart before justification can take place. And in order for man to retain justification, there must be continual obedience through active living faith that works by love and purifies the soul. She continues. It was impossible for the sinner to keep the law of God, which was holy, just, and good. But this impossibility was removed by the impartation of the righteousness of Christ to the repenting, believing soul. The life and death of Christ in behalf of sinful men or sinful man were for the purpose of restoring the sinner to God's favor, 
through imparting to him the righteousness that would meet the claims of the law and find acceptance with the Father. Elsewhere, back in the book Sons and Daughters, quote, When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Sounds a lot like 50-50 to me, Dennis. No kidding. They'll say, they'll say, no, no, it's all Jesus' merit. I just participate and cooperate. Like you were saying earlier. It's just cooperation, participation. But get that. Their model of sanctification is you put forth your best efforts and disposition. Jesus' divine merits are then imparted to you to make up the rest. And each day this effort is what maintains your justification. That is what Dennis technically means when he's saying by participation, cooperation, it's just conditions. It's not works. It's just conditions. Richard, what does this say about their understanding of holiness and the standard? Think about that. Think about that. You can be made right with the one true God by giving your best efforts, and then Jesus will fill in where you fall short. So God is a compromiser. God will accept some yeah. halfway holiness where I do my best and he makes up the rest. And notice it's it, they use that word impartation. She uses that word impartation over yeah. and over again because to them, you have to get holy through imparted or internal righteousness and he mentioned that a little bit ago about when he mentioned the sabbath you know that i have to be holy inwardly in order to keep the sabbath holy again there's no it's it's skipping over what i mentioned earlier in in romans 4 5 which was to him who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly his faith is counted or credited as righteousness. And so God doesn't compromise on holiness. Jesus Christ, the perfect Holy One, we receive His holiness, His righteousness. The second we come into faith, the second we come into union with Him, it's not some, you know, halfway thing where I'm doing my best to get internally righteousness, and that's what God accepts. No, it's only Jesus Christ and his perfection that God will accept, and that's why we have to be hidden in Christ. There are so many problems with their, their theory on this, like the idea that Christ's righteousness doesn't perfect. Like you can have the atoning benefits applied to some degree, but then they're not actually effectual to the consistent ends. Like the author of Hebrews tells us that Christ's sacrifice, those it was made for, it perfects. And exactly. in this system, you have this idea of like, well, you're getting the benefits like partially given to you gradually over time in accordance with your cooperation. And that's not how Paul describes justification or imputation for that matter, Dennis. The way that Ellen White described that there, that is not the way that the Apostle Paul describes either of those things. What Dennis really means is that the SDA church affirms a two-tier system of justification, initial and final, or as some of them will say, eschatological. That's what he means by justification and sanctification are side by side. He said in the first gospel, that's supposed to be us, sanctification doesn't matter. Yet did the Westminster Confession of Faith say that? Did it say sanctification doesn't matter? It says without holiness, no one's going to see the Lord. What are you talking about? Just like crazy statements like that, like in that first gospel, sanctification doesn't matter. And see, that's why these SDAs who are being influenced by this, they're downplaying sanctification. No, those people are probably caught in limbo of confusion of like they hear some truth over here and then they're trying to meld it with and parse through their own tradition and their own experience. There's a number of, of variables going on with that. But nevertheless, no, that. The, the mainstream Orthodox Christian gospel uh, is not poo-pooing on sanctification. Um, and, and yet again, I'll just say the last thing here before moving to this next part. Um, he needs to deal with being born dead in sins and trespasses. <laughs> like you've mentioned this a number of times. I've mentioned it. Uh, Dennis, you need to deal with that. That has to do with uh, a person's nature.
going to share with you a little illustration that I think you'll enjoy. God works like an infinitely skillful physician. He can save and heal anyone who trusts him. He is not at all satisfied when we come to his office just to be forgiven. He proposes to bring us to the place where we won't have to ask for forgiveness anymore. He offers to heal that place where people do their thinking. Then they won't violate those rules anymore because they don't even want to, and all the bad habits are gone. To some, that sounds ominously like perfection. Servants see, these, see this as a command. Friends see it as a promise. Friends don't want God to settle for anything less. Would you ask a physician not to heal you completely? Would you say, 75% healing will be quite sufficient, thank you? To servants who think of salvation as dealing with their legal problems, perfection is yet another requirement. To friends who think of salvation as healing the damage sin has done, perfection is an incredibly generous offer. Servants want to be completely forgiven. Friends want to be completely healed. About that matter of perfection, the heavenly physician might call after us as we walk away from his office. Don't worry about it. I've so designed my universe that it's a law people become like the person they worship and admire. If you really stay my trusting friends, perfection will come. I'm not saying you won't struggle anymore, but the struggle won't be the same. My friends, if there's any hope, for this elusive dream of perfection that Seventh-day Adventists talk about and is so maligned throughout the Christian world. It's got to be something like that. Healing by the great physician. Total healing, total restoration, total change in our lives. Again, with the caricatures. What a disastrous illustration. Who is saying people won't receive a full healing? Again, you're completely misplacing glorification, Dennis. Romans 8.30, you're over-realizing the timeline. Because in your system, there could be people that achieve glorification tomorrow by finally... The guy, the SDA, who's since the 70s, he's been working on it, he's on the, the process. Tomorrow, September 15th, 2023, that now becomes the day that he arrives. Bonk there, he's now arrived at glorification. In this life, you should have all sorts of people like that. They've been on the trek for 45 years. Where are you at, Dennis? How close are you? Have you arrived at glorification yet? That's what they're saying in their system is that you can arrive at glorification now. But also, he doesn't realize that both of man's faculties and will were impacted by the fall. Both man's faculties and will were impacted by the fall. Did you catch his balk at sin being a legal problem? Oh, yeah. Take it up with Jesus then, Dennis, because he said in the Lord's Prayer, read the parallel accountings, folks. Matthew 6, Luke 11. He equates sin with debt. It's one yeah. of the categories. Of, uh, that's, that's one of the ways that, that sin is described in Scripture, which is why on the article on our site, we explain that in greater detail. I brought that up earlier. You can check it out on our website. What is sin? He also balked at the idea of being a servant of Christ. Did you catch that? He used this yeah. illusion or, or illustration of uh, servant versus friend. He said servants want to be completely forgiven. Friends want to be completely heal healed. Why is that a dichotomy? Yeah, but I two, don't understand but, that. But two, uh, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul had no issue with being seen as a servant of Jesus Christ. I don't recall Paul saying a friend of Jesus Christ. So I'm not really sure what the point of his analogy is, except that it's not biblical and it isn't logically sound. But also, Ellen White had no issue viewing people as servants over and against friends when she said stuff like this. Quote, Christian Temperance and, and Bible Hygiene, 1890. Every true Christian will have control of his appetites and passions. Unless he's free from the bondage of appetite, he cannot be a true, obedient Servant of Christ. The indulgence of appetite and passion blunts the effects of truth upon the heart. So I'm not sure what his point is in this analogy of like, see, these people that view sin that way, they just want to be off the hook. Whereas those of us that view God like a friend, we understand that he wants to heal us. What? 
again, no, no concept of union with Christ, like at all. And all the benefits that come with that, it's just, you're over realizing where we're at in the timeline. What are your thoughts on that? And if we don't believe that the healing is done a hundred percent here and now in this life, you know, we just, we don't believe in it at all. We don't want it at all. I mean, again, I go back to what I said earlier of short circuiting God's process. I mean, our Jesus told us, you mentioned the Lord's prayer a minute ago. He told us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Um, was it Christ's goal to say, well, pray this until you shortly here after you're going to reach this state where you're no longer going to need to pray this? <laughs> I, I put up a video on that months ago. And I knew it was going to ruffle the feathers. I knew it was. And I was like, I want to see if a single Seventh-day Adventist will address this. Not a single one of them did. They all said, you took Ellen out of context. You don't know what you're saying. You're, 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 you're angry. You're, you're, you're. It's been months. I've tried to respond to almost every comment, at least that I get notified on that particular video. Um, and, and I've told every one of them, you guys aren't taking up Jesus's words. Jesus is the one that when his disciples asked, how do we pray? And Jesus taught them a daily prayer, which includes asking forgiveness for your sins. Oh, so you're saying there's a license to sin. I'm just saying that that's what Jesus said. So you have, you have to deal with that. You, you can't just, well, John over here says this. Okay. So set Jesus's words against John. Great solution. That doesn't change what Jesus said in the Lord's Prayer. So how do you understand what Jesus is saying in the Lord's Prayer? I had one person that tried to reach out that said, well, okay, if, if what you're saying is true, what about that day? It says for us to uh, uh, forgive us our sins as we have sinned against others. What if you haven't sinned against somebody else that day? Okay. <laughs> thank you for thank you for proving the point, sir. That, it doesn't deal with the fact that Jesus said it's a daily prayer. And part of that daily prayer includes forgive us our sins. And Jesus parallels the two accountings of that with debts. Even in Luke, in Luke, he actually says, forgive us our, uh, I believe he says sins and debts in the same, the same stanza. And so all that to say that, uh, yeah, now he's going to move into uh, disastrous illustration number two. Came across this little statement, which I thought really summarizes everything we're talking about. Now, the first gospel, the Christian gospel, can be summarized by one word, and the word is forgiveness. If you're forgiven, you're saved. That's the gospel. We can summarize this gospel with one word also, and the word is restoration. Restoration. This emphasis makes Seventh day Adventist theology unique. Remember the question, what is special about Seventh-day Adventism? What makes Adventism different? It's restoration in the gospel, not just forgiveness, not just making sure that your forgiveness of sins is up to date and then you're okay, but complete and total healing, restoration. Marrying strange theology with Adventist theology can justifiably be described as patchwork theology. And oh, my friends, for 30 years and more in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have been patching together our gospel with the Christian gospel, and we have got the worst hodgepodge that I have ever seen in my lifetime. Patchwork theology doesn't work. All kinds of people want a third tree. I put two trees on your diagram. People want a third tree, which patches together these two gospels. It isn't possible, not logically not consistently and not biblically. I mean, I appreciate his honesty around these Christianity and Adventism are not the same thing. I noticed they always tack on, uh, and you probably noticed this as well, they'll always tack on Seventh-day Adventist Christians. You're not just a Christian, you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian because that's really where the identity lies. So I'm glad that he's at least honest about that, that yes, Christianity and Adventism do not meld at all. It's its own thing. They need to own that. Um, and that's been part of the, the mission behind this in terms of the pressure on the Adventist organization is to own up to these sorts of things, more like Mr. Preby is. Um, but he said the Christian gospel 
what he presented as the Christian gospel, is only about forgiveness of sins. The Adventist gospel is about total restoration. Now, Dennis, the only restoration that's relevant and valid about your guys' gospel is the fact that you think the true gospel and the church completely fell away and you guys are restoring it. That's how it's a restorative gospel. It's part of these restorationist ideas that the pioneers coming from the Christian connection, a restorationist group, brought with them into Millerism and then into Seventh-day Adventism. Um, but that's about the only aspect of, of restoration that's going on in your guys' gospel because Exhibit A of the SDA Church is very, uh, you know, this is a, a perfect example of the SDA Church's very weak theology around new creation. <laughs> I, I mean, if being made a new creature in Christ isn't restoration, I'm not sure what is. And actually, no, they don't teach restoration. Again, their resurrection model is cloning. So Dennis isn't isn't going into that because this is an area that I've seen a ton of pressure put on in regards to Adventist theology about how wrong and off it is. They don't teach restoration. Their resurrection model isn't even a resurrection. It's not going to be the self-same body that went into the ground like Paul says. What's sown is then raised. They teach it's a completely different body that God will make and import your character or personality into that was preserved in his memory into that new body such that you can be recognized. That's not restoration. That's called a starting over, a plan B, a try over. Because even in their redo of Eden that they think they're on the path towards, it isn't Zion. Mount Zion's an unshakable kingdom, but in their model, it's a back to Eden status again. It will be rendered secure because you'll have demonstrated here while on probation that you can be trusted. It's a do over. It's not a restoration. The true restoration is the second Adam that did what the first Adam failed to do who came to redeem the creation, did so successfully by making it new. Now he rules and reigns over it as he subdues all things and his enemies are being made a footstool, again fulfilling what the first Adam was supposed to do and take dominion. That's true restoration. It's actually more of a more than a restoration. It's a massive upgrade because Zion is far better than Eden. Abraham was not looking forward, folks, or looking back, rather, for the better promised land, being back in Eden. He was looking forward to that better promised land, Zion. But then two, restoration is not what makes Adventism unique. The great controversy theme is what makes Adventism unique. Unique. It's the binding glue of the organization and everyone in it. Now, I'm sure he means their sanctuary model of cleansing, which is, you know, to totally unique to them. The apostles didn't preach it, the early church, the medieval church, the reformers. That's how unique it is. But that system most certainly is not restorative. It's led millions of people to hell. It's deceived millions of souls, confused countless minds. It's committed spiritual murder of who knows how many people. That's not restorative. It is a false gospel. And Paul says any other gospels than the one given by Christ to the apostles is cursed, damned, Galatians 1. They openly state in their official publications, the apostles didn't preach the SDA gospel. He clearly here is saying the Adventist gospel is a, a unique to Adventist gospel, making it a false gospel. It's cursed. It's anything but restorative. And then again, even though he hasn't given the Christian gospel, he straight up says Adventism has a different gospel. Thank you, Dennis, for your honesty. There you go. When I get people that say I'm lying, I'm misrepresenting, we don't know what we're talking about. No, I know very well what I'm talking about, my friend. Dennis is actually honest enough to admit it and say it assuredly. It is not Christian. They may tack on the word Christian to Seventh-day Adventist periodically. And he did that earlier, like I, like I mentioned. Seventh-day Adventist Christians. But they are Seventh-day Adventists. That is what they predominantly refer to themselves as. Being a Seventh-day Adventist is the identity, not Christianity. Any thoughts on that before moving to this uh, third to last section? Well, the biggest thing that jumped out at me and what he said was his summary of the Christian gospel being forgiveness versus the Adventist gospel being restoration. No, the Christian gospel is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is... And everything he has done, it is entirely sufficient. The Adventist gospel, as Dennis has been outlining, is Jesus Christ plus my 
cooperation with him in following all the Adventist rules and standards. Make no mistake about it. The Christian gospel is Jesus Christ, and the Adventist gospel is Jesus plus. Good stuff. It's true. So, my friends, I do believe there's a crucial issue at stake. Let's take a brief look at what happens in the fruits of this tree. The judgment. Is a judgment necessary in this gospel? If there are two people in church who look like they're doing the same thing, they are, they are to all outward appearances the same, but God can see into the heart of one that that one is, is, is making it up, is making a pretense of it, and the other one is a genuine. Doesn't that need some opening of books and examining of life and motive and activities so that everyone can see why one person would be happy and joyful in heaven and the other person would find it a living hell for the rest of eternity? Isn't a judgment necessary to answer questions that human beings and even angels can't understand? Because only God can read the motives of the heart and what has happened in their experience. So a judgment becomes crucially important, not as an opposition to the gospel, but as a demonstration of the gospel and how the gospel really is our salvation. Ellen G. White. I came across this statement from Dwight Nelson, as you may have seen some of his programs on net or whatever. If you've been in the Seventh-day Adventist church very long at all, you've been tempted to not believe in this prophet stuff. In today's religious environment, it's embarrassing to be different. It's embarrassing to have a prophet in your movement. You're considered a bit odd, a little strange. And so we have gone quiet about Ellen White. Without any fanfare or apology, we've simply gone silent. Don't quote her from the pulpit, we admonish each other. Just read the word. Didn't she give some counsel to that effect? But the time has come, this close to the end of Earth's civilization, to re-examine, reflect, re-study, and recommit ourselves to the mission and message of that woman, the most prolific female author in the history of the human race. It's time to stop apologizing for her ministry, both in our own movement and outside of it. And I say, well said, well said. We don't need to apologize or to feel second-class citizens because God chose to give us help at the end of time. And then after all those good things, he really stepped on our toes hard. He said, we shouldn't call these the red books. They're really the unread books. <laughs> wow. So he literally says, the visible church demonstrates the need for 1844 in the investigative judgment. I mean, for real? <laughs> Again, we get the straw man representation of what Christians believe about judgment, positioning it as, though we reject all judgment outright. Again, Dennis, despite this pesky document that just kind of transcends all borders, uh, the Apostles' Creed. But then his whole idea of judgment is filtered through, again, the great controversy theme. Everyone needs to see why one person would be joyful in heaven and another wouldn't. Where does the Bible say this? This is like a huge permeating thing. I used to hear all about in Adventism, about their, you know, in their seminars when they're talking about, or even sermons when they're talking about what heaven's going to be like. And of course, they're not consulting the Bible because the Bible doesn't go into a lot of these great details. But one of the key things that they're all looking forward to is, uh, the thousand year millennial reign of fact checking, as I call it, they'll be fact checking God's doing in the words of Stephen Bohr to be able to sigh, to give a sigh of relief and say, okay, we can trust him. He literally says that none of that is biblical. They read into phrases like books being opened anywhere. They'll see that. And they can insert all of this record keeping inspection that they're going to do about grandma and a cousin or whomever. He said judgment is for questions to be answered that people cannot understand. And since God can see the heart, he can answer them. And that's supposed to be not in opposition to the gospel, but as a demonstration of the gospel. Dennis, it's a part of the Adventist church's false gospel. It literally is a part of the gospel. Review and Herald states over and over again that the apostles didn't preach your gospel. You've tried labeling some of your guys' gospel as merely fruit of the gospel. 
when no, the stuff you're labeling as fruit is absolutely part of the SDA gospel. It should all be on the trunk. It's not just, oh, the fruits of this like foundation down here, which is what a lot of them try and position as. They love to say that. We're just the consistent ends of Methodism. We're just consistent Arminianism. And that's that kind of what he's doing here by putting all this, you know, sort of stuff that's kind of found in Methodism down in the trunk. And that's the platform and foundation when no, dude, the stuff that you're labeling as fruit is absolutely a part of the SDA gospel. It literally is your gospel, as we will see once they're all listed, once he gets to all of them. But they like to point to stuff in the tree trunk and say Adventism is just consistent Methodism. No, no, it's not. But then did Richard, did God give Ellen White as a help at the end of time? That's quite the way of putting it. Yeah, that's pretty funny, isn't it? As though, um, you know, people at the end of time need this special help that nobody ever needed in history before. This supposed special help, this supposed lesser light, so to speak. Yeah. It's like, why? You know, the other interesting it thing, too, is, you know, a, a, a Bible that's two inches thick versus her stack of books that if you stack them up are as tall as a grown man okay so everyone in redemptive history all of god's people before could just get by without all these thousands of additional pages of information but now it's needed yeah it's just like and then i when i first heard this the first thing i thought was so for help to his church God gave a Christological heretic and false prophet at the end of time to help out who exactly? What? He, used, he, he gave the gift of the church to clear everything up and to abandon the creeds, abandon Irenaeus, all the greats that came before us, you know, the, the shoulders of giants that God has literally given to the church to help propel, you know, things forward. No, no, no. We're supposed to throw all that out, throw out the creeds, throw out the confessions, start over, reinvent the wheel. And he gave this Christological heretic who couldn't exegete her way out of a wet paper bag who under her own admission would be sitting in the room while they're studying the word of God and was dull of hearing. That's her own words. Couldn't understand a lick of what they were saying. Who then gave numerous false prophecies claimed to be shown the day and the hour or given the day and the hour on multiple occasions, falsely gave all sorts of other failed prophecies and contradicts the word of God constantly. Genesis three, six being the big one. I always point to Adventist. You still haven't dealt with it. It says Adam was there with Eve deal with it. It says what it says. He was there with Eve. Don't give me the, Oh, well he, he, he couldn't have been there because if he would have been, then this would have been the conclusion deal with the text. Even the Hebrew, I've talked with a Hebrew scholar on this and I'm probably going to bring him on to discuss the specific topic of Genesis because this is one of his sweet spots. And we're going to talk about how in the Hebrew language, um, it literally, there, there's no way of dealing with the fact that Adam was there, which is part of the problem. But all of that to say, that's not who God gave to the church. That mm -hmm. that, that she was not a gift to, to the church. Um, so now he's going to move into this quote that he was saying there about the unread books. Cause you know, Ellen White's primary books are printed on like those red covers or whatever. And so he's got the little joke there. We shouldn't call them the red books. We should call them the unread books. You know, does it make a lot of difference if we hold a book burning ceremony in our backyard and burn all these legalistic Ellen White books so we don't have to look at them anymore? Or if we have every one of her books that she has ever written on our library shelves in pristine condition because we never take them down. Doesn't make much difference, does it? So we've got to decide what we believe about this gift given to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The law, the Ten Commandments, we say the law is not nailed to the cross. The law is for us today. The law can be kept by Christians, but watch it now. If I were to ask for a volunteer to let me follow you home with a video recorder, video everything you say and do of relevance for the next 30 days, and then bring you back up here 
and bring you before the people as a person who has kept the law perfectly for 30 whole days. Here's the proof. How many takers might I get today? Perhaps not many, because we remember just what happened yesterday and how we had to say, Lord, please forgive me again. Man, it's just like, it's just all anthropocentrism. <laughs> you know, he's supposed to be talking about the gospel here, and all I keep hearing about is like inward facing. What are you doing? What are you doing? It's you, 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 you. We're looking at this. If I followed you with a with a tape recorder, um, you, you, you. It just really, really showcases for us how Adventism, and, and to be fair, they're not the only ones that are this way, but it is just a man-centered message. They, they want to say, no, it's all about Jesus. It all revolves around Jesus. No, that doesn't mean that you just insert Jesus's name willy-nilly in Adventist systematic theology, Jesus is a conduit. He is a means to an end to where you can eventually get to a place where you don't need him anymore. He'll end and cease mediating once he's gotten you over the finish line and he, he's gotten you there. Then he'll switch to being king and and the, these other sorts of, of transitions. But Dennis, I appreciate your honesty and your forthrightness. I wish your fellow Adventists wouldn't try and play semantic games and act like I'm a liar or I have no clue what I'm talking about when I point out how central she is to your movement. Um, you can't have Adventism without Ellen White. It is not possible, at least not consistently. Sure, there's lots of fence sitter SDAs or nominal SDAs, but for anyone who's actually studied this movement and its systematic theology, you know that you can't have it without the other. You can't. We're not making this up. I'm not talking out the side of my neck, and he proves it. So Adventists need to own up to this and defend it. Otherwise, get out of Dodge. Leave Adventism. Become a Christian. If you don't want to defend this, then leave. It's part of Adventism. You can't have your cake and eat it too. I understand that might be uncomfortable, but that's the facts. You can't have one without the other. Then we got the classic, the law wasn't nailed to the cross line. I mentioned this earlier and said um, I, I wanted to, to get into this. I've addressed this in detail. Other people have as well, because again, folks, this isn't you know entirely unique to to me um, or our platform. But again, please check this out. Was the law nailed to the cross? Go through this. They are dependent upon these bad arguments to prop up their system and make it look like a home run. But once you remove the caricature, it collapses. I do not know a single confession of faith that claims that the law was nailed to the cross. I've heard individual Christians claim such regarding Colossians 2, and they typically are doing this to try and respond to the Sabbath being done away with. But not official source materials. Maybe it's out there somewhere, but that isn't the historic Christian argument. And I wish Christians would stop using these bad arguments, giving people like Dennis and other Adventists unnecessary cannon fodder. Because you don't need to say Colossians 2 says the law was nailed to the cross to totally womp the SDA church's position. <laughs> there are way better arguments that they are not prepared for. Because then, as you're aware, Richard, having engaged with enough Adventists, you then just end up going around the circle of just proof text back and forth, proof text back and forth, and not actually looking at the substance of what's being said. And if you catch that, and I have it in the article there for you folks, if you catch that, it's like, holy smokes, this decimates their entire system. Who cares about trying to argue the Sabbath from this passage? Understand what's being said about the sin debt being canceled. Their whole thing falls apart, <laughs> which not just that, but it's completely consistent, not with just Paul's own theology, but the rest of New Testament theology. Thoughts on uh, any of that stuff? I know that was a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. I mean, I think I already addressed the issue of the whole law being nailed to the to the cross earlier. And, you know, to be honest, I've made arguments like that in the past, but as you pointed out, it just, there's so much more we could get into that, that better refutes that. And I mean, they will call you out if you go down that road. I mean, that's, that's not a road that is really going to, to stand up. I mean, as you pointed out, it, it comes back to the Sabbath. And as you've been arguing, you know, about the new creation and whatnot, 
really they have no idea how to respond when you get into those arguments. They've not done this systematic work to see where the story of the Bible is leading, where the direction is. It's just been the the proof texting thing. Yeah, well, and well, yeah. Oh, it's it's getting long here, so I don't want to sidetrack in that because I can go on and on and on. But that is such a crucial, crucial aspect of discussion. And that's exactly right. If you understand new creation, because Paul leading up to that. And again, I'm not going to get into all this now, even in Ephesians 2, when he uses phrases like we are his workmanship, this, all this stuff is getting into new creation. And that is a much stronger argument against Seventh Day Sabbatarianism because they're not prepared for it at all. Because they're willing to concede and admit because they know that it's true that Sabbath is rooted in creation. People shouldn't deny that. People shouldn't, you know, get in a tizzy about that. I, we agree. You and I agree. The yeah. Sabbath is rooted in creation. Now we need to take into discussion both old and new creation. Okay. <laughs> Let's not just now point to Exodus 20 and then say, see, it's right there. It's rooted in creation. And so therefore Seventh-day Sabbath and that, that calls it quits. No, let's look at the whole picture and let's see about the new creation that scripture talks about and uh, the form of these things like in Deuteronomy 5 <clears throat> in comparison to Exodus 20, those sorts of things. So all that to say, folks, don't use the law nailed to the cross argument. Like you said, Richard, I used to use that argument as well when I was a, a, a more of a, a, an infant in, in the faith. And I'm not trying to dog on people that do. It's just you're giving them unnecessary cannon fodder when literally you can just totally womp their position by not going down that sort of road, because then you're going to get caught in the inconsistency yourself where they're, where they're going to basically say, well, you're just saying that because of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And, and you're going to say, well, no, I'm not. And then they're going to say, okay, well, what about lying? Well, that's repeated in the new Testament. Okay. Right. So now you're back at saying all of this only because of the Sabbath, you're going to say nine of the 10 are repeated. These just are not good arguments. These, these are not good arguments. Um, Cain killed Abel <laughs> that, so it's just there's a number of issues, Joseph and, and, and adultery with with Potiphar's wife. And, and yet we're not at Sinai yet. So there's a there's a number of issues there. But nevertheless, let's continue with what he uh, has to say here, where he now talks about the proof that the law can be kept by somebody with a fallen nature. So where's the evidence that the law can be kept by someone with a fallen nature? Where's the evidence? Ah, uh, you know, that's the only evidence we can, call, we can call upon. Not me, not you, not even the great heroes of the Bible, because everyone that has ever lived has been a sinner at some point in their life. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The only one that is the proof, the living proof, that the law can be kept by someone with a fallen nature is Jesus Christ, and only if he took a fallen nature. If he didn't take a fall in nature, no one has shown that to this day. And Satan is still winning the argument, you can't keep the law in a fall in nature. That's how important the subject is. And the Sabbath, that's just the flag of the law. You hold up the flag of the Sabbath as a statement, I love God's law. That's what the Sabbath really is all about, a statement of... It's interesting that in their false view of the law, when he says the law can be kept by a fallen creature, what he means is with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can be given a superpower to now keep the law, which is precisely in line with what Ellen White taught. How do we know this? Quote. Through Christ, a door of hope was opened that man, notwithstanding his great sin, should not be under the absolute control of Satan. Faith in the merits of the Son of God would so elevate man that he could resist the devices of Satan. Probation would be granted him in which, through a life of repentance and faith in the atonement of the Son of God, he might be redeemed from his transgression of the Father's law and thus be elevated to a position where his efforts to keep his law could be accepted. Close quote. That is not the standard. The law makes no provision for do-overs or a second try because Jesus came. They think having a do-over with a clean slate given and then continual seeking to, to keep it and confession and trying your best when you fall short. To then have your sin transferred to heaven for Jesus to blot out is somehow keeping the law. Nope, not even close. Doesn't work that way, folks. You break it once, it's over. And he said what Romans 3 says, all have sinned 
meaning it's game over. <laughs> it isn't that Jesus can give you a clean slate to try your best and eventually you'll get to a sinlessly perfect state when you're keeping it perfectly. That's not keeping the law, Dennis. That is not keeping the law. But furthermore, this is all coming through the lens of the great controversy, which the Bible is then filtered through. Where in the Bible, Dennis, does it say that Satan is making the charge that God's law can't be kept by any human? It doesn't. This is all your pre-earth origin st story coloring in the lines for you. Folks, he's just regurgitating this. Quote, this is from Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 564. He, that's Jesus, came to demonstrate the fact that humanity, allied by living faith to divinity, can keep all his commandments, or all of, God, all of the commandments of God. He came to make plain the immutable character of the law, to declare that disobedience and transgression can never be rewarded with eternal life. He came as a man to humanity, that humanity might touch humanity, while divinity laid hold upon the throne of God. Another quote, lift him up, page 235, a devotional book. Quote, Christ left his position in the heavenly courts and came to this earth to live the life of human beings. This sacrifice he made in order to show that Christ's charge, or that, sorry, that Satan's charge against God is false. That it is possible for man to obey the laws of God's kingdom. Close quote. Richard, where does the Bible say this is why Jesus came and died to essentially give people a do over at trying to keep the law? Well, yeah, I mean, I had the same question all along is where in the world does the scripture say this? I can't for the life of me find it or remember it. And I don't know of anyone else who can. I mean, this is getting into not sola scriptura here, but sola Ellen. Yeah, and it's just more, again, more great controversy theme filtering. The Bible does not say that the Sabbath is a statement of loyalty, and you no. and I are Sabbatarians. Yeah. <laughs> like, the Bible nowhere says this. Richard, you just wrote an article for the website on this. Mm -hmm. The Christian Sabbath versus the Adventist Sabbath. People, you can check that out in the search bar on the website. Christian Sabbath versus the Adventist Sabbath. And this is one of the major differences that you pointed out. Nowhere does the Bible say that the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty, the seal of God, all this other stuff. Like he said earlier, oh, it's a sign of a person's commitment to God. Ellen White did repeatedly, but nowhere does the Bible say such. It doesn't. It doesn't. And then they, yeah. they take this filter and lens to the Bible and they look around. They'll go to Ezekiel and they'll go to Exodus and they'll say, see, it says it's a, it's a sign between me and, and my people forever. That doesn't say it's the seal. That doesn't say it's a sign of loyalty because the Westminster framers, for example, Christian Sabbatarians down through the years, not seventh day Sabbatarians, but crit, not Judaizing Sabbatarians, but Christian Sabbatarians mm -hmm. down through the ages have all agreed with that. Right. It's a perpetual sign. How, how does none of them came to this conclusion? And we're talking about greats of the Christian faith, not just Joe Schmo off in the corner. We're talking about the, the, the large majority. None of them came to this conclusion. None of them came to this conclusion that if somebody disagrees with me on this, they're lost. If somebody disagrees with me on this, they're not a, they're not a Christian. If somebody disagrees with me on this, they're not going to get the seal. If somebody disagrees with me on this, they're not loyal to God. So why is it that they're coming to this conclusion? Oh, right. The great controversy theme. That's why. All right. Health message. All right. Up to the top of the tree. Health. Uh, let's say you find a person on your street who isn't doing so well physically. You take pity on this person. You say, if you will allow me to tell you exactly what you're going to do with your life for the next month, I will bring you into my home and we'll get you fixed up. Will you do that? He says, I'm desperate. I'll do it. He comes into your home. You teach him all the laws of health reform, every one of them. He follows them faithfully. And you know what? The statistics are, even if a person has messed up their life, that following the laws of health faithfully will give them extra years of life on this earth. And he does. He has his extra years of life. And then he dies a natural death. And he wakes up in the wrong resurrection at the end of the millennium. Have we done him any good? We gave him extra years of life. He didn't get a heart attack. 
That's what health reform is all about, isn't it? Or not? Not at all. Health reform is very simple. The body and the mind are one unit. What affects one affects the other. And it goes both ways. If the body is all messed up, the blood supply is all messed up, and the blood supply feeds the brain where we do our thinking and our choosing and where God brings his salvation calls to us. So if a person is physically messed up, he is mentally messed up at the same time. So what is health reform about? To get the body in good shape, to get the blood supply in good shape, to get the brain functioning properly so that God has a fighting chance to save our souls so that God can talk to us and we're not just in a fog in which we can't hear anything at all. Health reform does not save, but health reform makes it a lot easier for God to save us. Wow. Wow. When I first heard that, I, I was in the car. <laughs> I was taking my son to the park. I like had to double take there in the car and I'm like, did he seriously just say that right now? Before getting into the, the bombshell that he says there, the health message will give you extra years of life on earth. Richard, true or false? False. I mean, don't even get me started on that. I'm just incredibly thankful to the Lord that I got out of eating my Adventist diet before I really became diabetic. I mean, if I ate the way, so I'm a type one diabetic. And if I ate that way now, I'd be all over the map with, with out of control blood sugar. It was just, you know, piling on carbs and carbs. In fact, I had an, an, an Adventist friend recently arguing with me about that, that, you know, high carb is what you need. And it's like, dude, I can't do it. It doesn't work. Give me a break. <laughs> Yeah, this like fault one size fits all understanding of again, this goes back to the great controversy theme and we're returning to Eden. We're going back to the Edenic diet and like it, these sorts of things. That is just like the, it's not what the Bible says, man. That that's your great controversy theme clouding everything. It's funny. Dennis has to resort to the claims of the blue zone data, which is skewed and biased, mm -hmm. by the way, folks, and says if you follow every principle of it you'll be guaranteed more years on this earth. Dennis, th then why does the Okinawa Japan zone, for example, utilize pork? Why does the uh, Greek zone incorporate wine? Both things that are completely off limits, according to the Adventist health message. But notice how weak and impotent the Adventist God is. Their message of health reform is necessary for God to have a fighting chance to save a person's mm -hmm. soul. I just like the anachronistic reading of that. Dennis, the, the Adventist health message wasn't given until the 19th century. A fighting chance, even just all the craziness around God's sovereignty and, and who you're talking about here when you say it's all of that stuff aside. The message is novel to the 19th century. God was saving people long before then. It just these anachronistic sort of things. That's just like, how can you say such a thing about God the Almighty? I guess I missed that in Paul's Damascus Road conversion, Richard. Well, God, and his, yeah. God in his great glory manifests himself to Paul, blinding him, knocking him down to the ground. It's so powerful, Paul can't help but to turn to the Lord in repentance. What a patently absurd thing to say. But it's great insight into how weak the Adventist God is, or gods, I guess I should say. <laughs> They're trying yeah. their best to save people, but have all these obstacles in the way, like whether or not you eat cheese or mustard and drink tea. If you do that, they're unable to communicate to your mind. Because that's totally what Hebrews 1, for example, tells us about how God speaks today. He's speaking in your mind, and if you eat certain foods, it can be clouded. It's like we jumped into like a quasi Eastern religion sort of thing going on here, which in turn uh, of eating, you know, cheese, mustard, it, it doesn't, it, it keeps God from having a fighting chance of saving your soul. Totally laughable, man, for anyone who's had a radical conversion. 
He said health reform doesn't save. It just makes it a lot easier for God to save us. Uh, except Ellen White claimed it was salvational. Quote, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7, page 136. Those who teach the principles of health reform should be intelligent in regard to disease and its causes, understanding that every action of the human agent should be in perfect harmony with the laws of life. The light God has given on health reform is for our salvation and the salvation of the world. Close quote. Furthermore, she said it was a part of the Adventist gospel. Bit of a long, in, a long quote incoming, folks. But notice, this is what Dennis is parroting. Quote, the health reform I was shown is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and hand with the human body. I saw, again, I saw, that we as a people must make an advanced move in this great work. Ministers and people must act in concert. God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves, which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left this work for them to do. It's an individual work. One cannot do it for another. Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Quotes from scripture there. Gluttony is the prevailing sin of this age. Lustful appetite makes slaves of men and women and beclouds their intellects and stupefies their moral sensibilities to such a degree that the sacred, elevated truths of God's word are not appreciated. The lower propensities have ruled men and women. In order to be fitted for translation, so after all that, the health message is the right arm of the gospel. It's a work that needs to be carried out with boldness. You need to know about disease and all this sort of stuff. You need to be equipped on this. In order to be fitted for translation, the people of God must know themselves. They must understand in regard to their own physical frames that they may be able, to, uh, with the psalmist to exclaim, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. They should ever have the appetite and subjection to the moral and intellectual organs. The body should be the servant to the mind and not the mind to the body. So again, he is just parroting Ellen White as though that is authoritative. None of that is in scripture. Her proof texting verses out of context does not make it so. David didn't say what he did with Ellen White's novel health message in mind. That unless you adhere to the Adventist health message, God won't be able to communicate to your mind and be able to save you. That's what he'll try and label as conditional. It's just conditional. No, no. It's not that you have to believe it to be saved. It's just one of the conditions to participate in salvation. But yes, Dennis, you guys do think it's salvational because it's a part of your guys' gospel message. And Paul tells us in Romans 1, 16 through 17, that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all that believe it. So with that in mind, that's why I'm always asking Adventists, what's the gospel? What's the gospel? We had an Adventist a couple weeks ago in the open mic who called in who I brought up their pillar doctrines of their novel gospel message, which includes this. And he was like, well, wait, you, you think that we, we teach and believe that you have to believe all this to be saved? Yes, because you're calling it the gospel. And the apostle Paul says that the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all that believe it. So what is that message? The Adventist church has labeled this as their gospel message or part of it, the health message. So yes, that's what you're saying by calling it the gospel. And that's my entire point with this platform. That isn't the gospel. <laughs> that's not the gospel. That that that's the point. That's that's precisely the the point. So yes, Dennis, don't tell people that you guys don't teach it salvational, especially when you're going to go on to say, like we mentioned earlier, we kind of spilled the beans on this. You're going to go on to say that if God's revealed something, then it's it's salvational. <laughs> so it's a it's a constant sort of flip flop that's going on here. Any thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, I mean. I would just ask again, you know, this is coming from the denomination that loves to talk about how their sola scriptura, where in the scripture do we find all of this stuff, you know, that we are to do so that God can speak to our minds so that he can have this supposed fighting chance to save us. Instead, we find the opposite. We find Jesus saying in Mark 7, it's not what goes into the man 
that defiles him, but what comes out. Uh, we find Paul saying, let no one judge you in food or drink. I mean, the examples over and over again in the New Testament, Colossians 2.16, or not Colossians 2.16, but Colossians 2, do not taste, do not touch. Paul says these things have an appearance of wisdom, but they are useless in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so... Yeah. The New Testament seems to be exactly contrary to the Adventist, the purpose of the Adventist health message. I mean, 1 Corinthians 8.8 8 just buries everything he just said. Because essentially what he's saying is, is that diet is what's going to bring you closer to God. Paul literally says in 1 Corinthians 8.8 8, that food cannot do that. That's that. And it's perfectly right. in line, like you said, with what Jesus says in Mark 7 about what truly defiles a person. They won't always be like, Jesus, no, he's talking about hand washing there. Right, folks, <laughs> because they're talking about eating. And he literally says mm -hmm. anything that goes into a person, into his stomach and is expelled, can't defile him. So it's perfectly in line. But Richard, I think you're missing where, where Paul talked about what Dennis is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 10. We, You and I, I guess, have been reading the amended version of the Bible. Because in there, when he was talking to the, the Gentile about the Gentile meat market, which more than likely would have had pig and those sorts of things there that were sacrificed to, to idols. When Paul commended them that it was okay for them to do such practices, unless it was going to be, you know, some sort of um, individual conviction upon their, their own conscience, you missed the part in there where he told them, you know, I'm, I'm telling you that you can, you have the freedom to do this, but if you do, it's going to becloud your mind and then you're not going to be able to hear God speaking to you. So I think that's where we, where he got it from is first Corinthians chapter 10, but nevertheless, okay. Now he's moving into our, our, our last segue out here regarding SDA standards and Satan being an incredible communicator. Standards of the church. And I'm talking again about all of them. Let's say that uh, you listen to your pastor and do what your pastor says 75% of the time. And then you listen to your favorite TV personality and do what he or she says the other 25% of the time. Who's going to win that little tug of war? I'm afraid your pastor is on the losing side because we've got this fall in nature, don't we? So what is going on here? Is Satan a good communicator? Does he know how to reach through to our minds even when we don't know he's reaching through to our minds? Does he know how to get behind our will and choice faculties to the emotions? He's a good communicator. Is God a good communicator through the Holy Spirit? So we've got two master communicators, both trying to convince us of the rightness of their ways. Every day of our life, they're trying to convince us that they're right. Standards, what are they for? If your standards are lifted up high, you know what you can actually do? You can shut Satan's voice out of your life in a whole bunch of ways. Wow. Wow. Satan is a master communicator in comparison to God Almighty. If that isn't the most SDA thing ever, I don't know what is. It is a perfect example of how, to use the words of Ellen White, his satanic majesty is always elevated. What a ridiculous statement. Both are trying to convince us of their ways. Dennis, read Romans 1 through 3. No, the fallen man is naturally hostile to God, cannot seek for God, is a hater of God who cannot do any good, by nature a child of wrath, and so on. This idea that man is some neutral agent and Satan and God are tugging at every human being, pulling them in two different directions. And man's the final arbiter is not at all biblical. Look at it, folks. Romans 3. The Adventist church just has such a bad anthropology. This is Paul writing to, to Jewish converts. Who, after he explains what's going on in the first two chapters regarding sin would have been tempted to think, oh, right, but I'm, a, I'm an Israelite. I've been given the law. A level of superiority there, ethnic or national superiority. And so Paul's response after explaining 
things he does in say Romans chapter one about the downgrade into sin and the the, the slide that may, fallen man is in. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? So again, he's anticipating the question of the, the Jew of, well, I'm a Jew. I'm not a Gentile. He says, are we any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, that's a biblical way of saying all people, are under sin as it is written. Now he quotes from the Old Testament. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they've become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. So no. The Adventist church, or sorry, the Apostle Paul did not have the idea the Adventist church does. Sorry, folks. I got uh, hang-ups here on, uh, on my end regarding a couple slip-ups. No, the Apostle Paul did not have the great controversy worldview that informed his understanding of man. He explains to Jews who would have been tempted to think, we were given the law. We're not like the Gentiles who weren't given that. That no, they're in the same boat as the rest of fallen humanity, which is naturally hostile to God. This is before he transitions in the next chapters, four through eight, to then explaining how the gospel is the remedy to that problem. This is one of the weakest points of Adventist theology, in my opinion. They do not have a biblical anthropology. People tend to get hung up on their state of the dead with this topic. But their understanding of man's nature and, and natural disposition toward God, and that unless he's the first mover, changes the disposition of the individual that was just described there, acting upon the will of a person, freeing that person from being a slave to sin, they will continue down that path. They're already citizens of the kingdom of darkness, Satan's domain. <laughs> That's the result of Adam being their fallen federal head that he balked at and scoffed at earlier. Fallen humanity is not in some neutral state that has two good communicating influencers. It's almost like that stereotypical like angel and devil on the shoulder type thing, trying to sway them one way or the old one way or the other. But also, no, Dennis, the Adventist God is a horrible communicator. The evidence of this is in the Miller chart fiasco. I mean, give me a break. God told her that the numbers shouldn't be changed. They were as he wanted them. Then they changed three times and the narrative became, well, God had his hand over a mistake and, it was, and he was testing us. Present truth. He supposedly gave Ellen the day and hour of Jesus' is coming multiple times. She just couldn't quite get to seem to get it. We've looked at all this before, so I won't rehash it. It's on our website as well. But my goodness, man. No, the Adventist God is a horrendous communicator. That can't, they, they, the heavenly trio can't even seem to get their point across clearly, which has left you guys with a wake of embarrassment and errors in your past. Richard, is Satan the problem for man's will? No. And, you know, in the midst of all this false idea of, you know, the two just competing for you, let's talk a little bit about God's power to save. So I think about what the Lord Jesus himself said in John 6, 37. He said, all that the Father gives me, now think about that. There's a people that the Father has given him. And he repeats that over and over again in the Gospel of John. It's repeated multiple times in chapter 6. It's repeated numerous times in John 17. Look it up. But he says, all that the Father gives me, will come to me. And so what does that say about the power of God to bring sinners to himself? We uh, looked earlier at Romans chapter 8, specifically verse 30, where it says, those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called, he also justified. The structure of that 
of that grammar is such that all of the called are justified. All of the predestined are called. In other words, if you're involved in that chain at one step, you're involved in it at every step. There's no indication in the grammar to allow for somebody receiving this particular call and failing to be justified. It's no, it's it's talking about a call where if you receive it, you're also justified. And if you're justified, you're also glorified. I mean, that's plainly what it says. And regarding the ability of man, in the same chapter I mentioned, John 6, Jesus says in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he repeats a similar statement in verse 65, where he said, I told you, you cannot come to me unless it is granted you of the Father. And so man is exceedingly weak, you know, can't come to God without God taking the initiative first. But God is incredibly powerful. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That's what Jesus plainly says. Yeah, it's just another example of how in Adventist theology, due to the great controversy theme, everything is Satan's fault. It isn't man's fault, ultimately, it's Satan's fault. It's Satan's fault. It's not Adam's mm -hmm. fault, it's actually Satan's fault, ultimately. It's Satan's fault that they sin. It's Satan's fault they're in the predicament they're in, and so on. Adventists, it is not Satan's fault that you sin. <laughs> it is not Satan's fault that you sin. He said, if you raise your standard real high, it'll shut Satan out of your mind. Yeah, that sounds great and all, Dennis, except unless you're born again, united to Christ, he already has your mind. You're born part of his domain, the kingdom of darkness. You're in Adam, as Paul says in Romans 5, which is a term of headship. Just like in Christ is a term of headship and union with Christ, all of fallen humanity is in Adam. Again, this is the false idea that man is a neutral agent, and it's kind of just assumed. All right, let's try and crank this out here. You can stop him from talking to you. You can move away from what he is trying to say to you by what you don't read, what you don't watch, what entertainment you don't participate in, so that Satan doesn't have that full access to your minds all the time. And if you've blocked Satan out of your mind, does that give God a little more opportunity to talk to you? Open up some channels of communication that weren't there before? Okay, so that means that high standards, faithful standards, give God a fighting chance to save your soul. Standards don't save you, but standards open a door for God that would be shut otherwise if your standards are low or missing because Satan has full access to your mind 100% of the time. Standards become vitally important, you see, in this gospel, not as a means of salvation, but as a participation, a cooperation in God's 100% work of justifying you and sanctifying you. Everything that he said is behavioral. Notice all the issues are strictly behavioral. Which again, he mentioned that at the beginning, that there's no concept of sin as a, as a nature. And if you believe that that is the case, you can't then also believe it's behavioral. There's apparently some mutual exclusivity for some reason. He said, overcoming sin is as simple as turning the TV off and not eating bacon, essentially. <laughs> In their eyes, that's the root problem. Not the rotten fruit that's a result of the real root problem which is that you are by nature a child of wrath, dead in your sins and trespasses, and need to be brought to spiritual life and raised by God, which is an actual change in one's nature. It's not just some pithy poetics that Paul decided to employ in writing Ephesians. But he said, closing off opportunities for Satan opens up others for God to be able to reach you. Again, the, the impotence of the Adventist God. Nowhere does scripture give an inkling of Yahweh being limited by such things as your diet and sin limiting him from being able to reach you. 
again, for people who had radical conversions where God, regardless of the person's sinful disposition, radically changed them by his sovereign freedom and his ability to save for his own eternal glory. You just hear these things and you're like, shoot, if that were the case, I'd have never had a chance. <laughs> I'd have been, I wasn't seeking for God. You know, and I know everybody's experience isn't the same. I'm just saying when I hear stuff like that, as somebody who had a radical conversion, it's just like, dude, that does not align at all with with my conversion. The irony of his statement is that his standards are way too low. His standards of God's holiness, his standards of sin. God's been demoted to being like a creature. Satan's been elevated to be some legitimate rival to God and communicate in the communication department. Unless you do something that can open up the doorway for God, he's just stuck in a, like a beggar status. He's done all he can. He's trying his best, but that's as far as it can go. <laughs> Any thoughts on that before transitioning here? Oh, again, you know, it's it's easy to, you know, chuckle at it. But in reality, it's just exceedingly sad. And obviously, you know, a person who's been indoctrinated into Adventism and not known actual biblical Christianity doesn't see the issues with this. But when you know the true God, the true Christ, as he is revealed in the Holy Scriptures, to hear these things is just appalling. It is absolutely appalling, you know, that God is, is just, his hands are tied unless you do this or don't do that. It's just totally repulsive to, to basic biblical teaching and, and Christian reason. All right, that's the gospel I understand to be the gospel of the Bible, the gospel of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And here is a little statement that I think is relevant for us today. It is sad to see the illusion further popularized that such lifestyle issues as diet and adornment come from a religious perspective but are, quote, not a matter of salvation. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. Wow, that's a good principle. If the written counsel of God addresses a subject, it must have something to do with salvation or God would not have wasted his time. It may not be the means of salvation, but it may be a condition of salvation or an, a way to achieve salvation or God would not have bothered talking about it. Well, my friends, that is what I understand to be the gospel of the Bible and what is unique about Seventh-day Adventism. And I'll go one step farther here. Satan's great objective, as best I can tell, is to destroy this gospel. He is content for you and me to be Sabbath keepers, believing that Jesus Christ is coming literally in the clouds of heaven. We won't fall for Satan impersonating Christ. We're not going to believe that there are ghosts around. We're not going to be tricked by Mary appearances around the world. We're not going to be involved in all of these deceptions. But if we believe a false gospel, he's got us. And he doesn't care if we believe all the right things about the Sabbath and the second coming of Christ and the state of man after death. If we, if we believe his gospel, that it is allowable to go on sinning in some way until Jesus comes, then he's got us, no matter what truth we believe in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So, as we saw, throughout this whole thing. He considers the gospel to be systematic theology. But he says, if the written counsel of God addresses a subject, that must be salvation related or God would have left it alone. I mean, if that doesn't summarize why so many SDAs are confused, mm -hmm. sadly, I don't know what will. Everything is a gospel issue. Everything, literally. And notice, he doesn't just contain it to the Bible, but Ellen White's writings fall under written counsel of God. Did you catch that? Yeah. He said anything that falls under the written counsel of God. Well, that's not just the Bible. So all of what you mentioned, the, the Mount St. Ellen in comparison to Mount St. Helens, which is a fair comparison. 
Yet five minutes ago, he said the health message isn't salvation related. So everything Ellen White gave counsel on and what scripture gives counsel on, it's all a gospel issue. This showcases they don't understand the gospel because, again, Paul says the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all that believe it. It's not every single doctrine revealed by God. It's a specific, distinct message. The average lay Christian who isn't a theology nerd is not getting into systematic theology. They simply love Christ, serve their local extension of his body with their giftings. They worship him. They love their family. They're involved in their local sphere. And they know the simple gospel. That person's able to tell you the gospel. The person at my church who knows not a lick about systematic theology, they fit the bill that I just described, yet they can still tell you the gospel. It's not a bunch of this, this whole system of all this stuff. And Adventists do this all the time, man. And you run into this because if you're a Calvinist, you have to deal with this added uh, caricature that they're going to throw of, well, that's Calvinism. That's, that's just because you're a Calvinist. That's, so anytime you disagree with them, it's, well, that's Calvinism. And so they see everything as a systematic theology. It's like, yo, homeboy, Calvinism's not the gospel. Because people who are not Calvinists can still be Christians because they have the same gospel and the same God. So it's not systematic theology, and that's the key. Even the lay Christian can understand the gospel. I mean, just apply this historically. I get that in Adventism, the church was truly born in the 1800s. But man, those poor medieval Christians, those poor medieval Christians who didn't have systematic theology, the poor Christians in the 600s, 700s, etc. But he said, th this is just like, whenever I hear this, I'm always like, well, no wonder they have the persecution complex. When you say stuff like this, Satan's greatest objective is to destroy the Adventist gospel. Think about that. The greatest adversary, you know, the greatest evil in the world, you know, whatever title you want to say. His greatest mission is to destroy the Adventist gospel. I mean, the irony. Dennis, Satan is the originator of the Adventist gospel. He's not trying to destroy it. He employed it. He said, if we have a false gospel, Satan has us. Dennis, you have a false gospel. Your gospel contained nothing about the person and work of Jesus. The literal base layer of the gospel is not predestination. It's the person and work of Jesus. Your gospel had nothing about the good news of Jesus Christ. It was a remedial presentation of a systematic theology of libertarian freedom contrasted over and against predestination. It was basically a surface presentation of the Pelagian controversy with Augustine. You didn't even present the gospel, sir. Again, great controversy paradigm informs everything. You have a novel gospel that was born in the 1800s. Your own publications openly state that the apostles didn't preach it, the church fathers didn't preach it, the reformers, only you guys. It is not apostolic in origin. That means it's not the once for all gospel that Jesus Christ revealed to the apostles that's been handed down for us today. Satan already has you, my friend. The root issue of all of this is the great controversy worldview, because even the two trees that you tried to present and say, well, this is the Christian one that some Adventists have tried to adopt. And then in the fruit of the branches tried to, you know, make it work. And no, Dennis, there's an underlying thing that connects all of you guys. The great controversy worldview, because even in the second tree that's supposed to be the Christian tree, you're caricaturing it because you're even reading that through the great controversy theme. Any thoughts on that before we move to the very last section in his sign-off? Oh, yeah. I mean, totally spot on, you know. Great controversy stuff overlaid on all of this. Um, just assumed. I, I mean, again, show me from the Bible where all this, this whole great controversy worldview is. Um, I mean... The scriptures totally decimate this whole thing that, you know, God is trying to prove himself the good guy and Satan the bad guy. You know, he's just he's trying to win you over, but Satan is winning you over. 
you know, underlying all of this is a fundamental distrust of the character of God, the biblical God. And this whole idea, you know, that the creature needs to see if the creator is good, that, you know, we as sinners get to make decisions about what God is like. I mean, that's that's what underlies the whole thing. That's really the foundation is a lack of trust in the character of God. And I would just say Adventists, God is good. He is the objective standard. There is no other. He doesn't have to prove to you anything. He's holy God. You're a sinner. This whole thing is absurd. This whole great controversy that, you know, God is trying to show you that he's the good guy and Satan is the bad guy. No, God is God. He is objectively good. Take him or leave him as he is. And so I believe that this is Satan's last attack upon God's remnant people just before the second coming of Christ destroy their gospel, negate their gospel, compromise their gospel, make sure that my understanding of salvation takes preeminence in their lives. And he's got us. And this is the great, great danger of the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, is a compromised gospel. Everything else, every problem that we have in the church today, no matter what controversies we have, flow out of that. That is the root cause, which is why I don't spend much time talking about symptoms of apostasy, and there are quite a few of them. But I want to talk about the root cause of apostasy, and that is living, believing, and being persuaded that a gospel is not quite what we thought it was. It's, a, it's an easier gospel. It's a gospel which is more comfortable to me, a gospel I can live in and still sin a fair amount and I'm still okay. All right. That is my understanding of the gospel, and here is where we're going to uh, uh, kind of adjust a little bit. Up to this point, I have not said anything that should give you any evidence that what I'm saying is true, because all I have given you are my opinions. Have you noticed that? I haven't opened the Bible. I haven't given you any inspiration at all to support anything I've said, so I'm going to ask you to do, do something. Don't believe what I've said because I've said it, because if you do, you'll believe someone else because they say it. Believe it only if you have studied it for yourself and know for yourself what is true. So we'll spend the rest of our time during this seminar opening up the Word of God to see if these things are so. All right, so that was all of it. So Satan's gospel is what he presented as the mainstream Orthodox Christian gospel. All of that to get to, that's Satan's gospel. And what he presented as the Adventist gospel is the real gospel. Thoughts on that, Richard? Well, yeah, I guess in his mind then, everybody is of Satan. Everybody is wrong except for Adventists, of course, and we know that's that's the mentality. But as you've pointed out, you know, they're on record admitting that this gospel they preach, this gospel they've been given in the 1800s, nobody preached it before. Nobody was given it before. It's been uniquely given to them. And it doesn't take a lot of thinking to realize the Apostle Paul said, if it's any gospel other than the one we preached, those guys back there 2,000 years ago in the beginning of the Christian church, let him be accursed, even if an angel from heaven brings it. You know, Ellen White's accompanying angel, for example, does that ring a bell? Uh, a little a bit. Curse. I mean, so... They're on record saying this is a unique gospel to the 19th century. You know, it came through the writings of Ellen White, their helper that, you know, had angels revealing this stuff. And yet the Bible tells us, clearly warns us against this sort of thing that, you know, even we or an angel from heaven, as Paul says, should deliver to you a different gospel than the one we preached. Let him be accursed. 
And so by their own admission, they have a different gospel that is under the curse pronounced in Scripture. It's sad. Um, I'm going to comment on that actually after I let you go, because this went really long. My friend, thank you for being here. I know that this was a lot. Um, so thank you for giving us some time. I think that this will be beneficial for people to see. Um, nice to just be a little bit more relaxed as well and just kind of spend the evening together talking about some stuff that I know that you and I are both passionate about. Any last thoughts that you want to share? I'm going to let you go and then I will do our sign off. If you don't have anything else, no pressure. You don't have to say anything else. I don't know if there's anything you want to plug or anything like that. But uh, if not, no worries. I would just conclude by saying the gospel is not all this systematic theology. It's not, you know, the mechanics. As interesting as, as, you know, the mechanics of theology are, the gospel is Jesus Christ. It is the person of Jesus Christ. Specifically, it is Christ given for you in his life, his death, his resurrection. If you will have him, he, in his entirety, will be yours, and you will have everything you need in him for now and for all eternity. You are complete in him, as scripture says. And so realize that. And if you haven't given yourself wholly and solely to Christ, please do that and know the joy of the Lord. Amen. Brother, thank you for being here. I'll be talking to you, I'm sure. We'll have to do something like this again, um, maybe on uh, another preview video or maybe uh, a different topic, but we'll be talking. So again, thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. All right, folks. Did you notice there at the end, Preview said, this entire time I haven't opened up the Bible or cited any inspiration. It's just been my opinion. Now, I know I said at the beginning, this isn't going to be a Bible study. It's going to be a comparison because in the later videos in the playlist, he's going to get into Bible study and that sort of stuff. But Dennis, it wasn't just your opinion. It wasn't just your opinion. And this is the thing I hear constantly from SDA leaders. You know, we just looked at it a few weeks ago. Mark Finley. In my imagination. I see Satan holding a diabolical council meeting in outer space somewhere. Like, no, you don't, dude. You just read Ellen White. You're literally, and then we like whip it out. It's like, no, dude, you're literally just influenced by Ellen White. Why are you saying this as though you didn't get this from somewhere? It's like these little subtle things. And I'm like, why are you guys like that? Even here, Preby's like, we shouldn't shy away from Ellen White. Well, dude, you didn't just give your opinion tonight. You literally were just regurgitating Ellen White. It's like, I'll listen to these SDA pastors. People will send me stuff. I respond to videos typically that people are sending me or, or that sort of thing. And it's like, I just start listening wherever I may be at. And I'm just like, no, you're quoting Ministry of Health right there. No, no, you're just paraphrasing sons and daughters. Like, no, you're just paraphrasing faith and works. That's great controversy. That's Christ in a saint. Like, so for somebody who, I'm not saying every person has to be at that level, folks. I'm not trying to say I'm some sort of expert even. But for somebody who understands it at that level, to hear you say these things like, no, it's just my opinion or I imagine. No, no, you were citing Ellen White because at the end of the day, that's where all of your guys' theology is coming from. Now, of course, I'm going to have all the SDAs that are like, I can prove all my theology from the Bible alone. And... Uh, yeah, okay. I understand what they mean, but you're not in the discussion at that point, folks, because people like Dennis Preeby, Stephen Bohr, Doug Batchelor, Ted Wilson, these people know how foundational Ellen White is to the whole thing. So the point being is, Dennis, no, it wasn't just your opinion. It was your paraphrasing of Ellen G. White. That's what was actually going on. But I want to circle back, closing thought here, closing question to, to leave everybody with. If you weren't here in the beginning, the very opening statement that Dennis gave, Adventism is worth dying for, he said. Is Adventism really worth dying for, folks? 
That's a that's a bold statement. I don't doubt that he he seriously believes it. I'm not you know calling any of that into question, but Adventism's worth dying for. No, Mr. Preby, Adventism's not worth dying for. Jesus Christ is worth dying for. And I know that you're going to say, well, Jesus Christ started it, you know, which that even misses the point. Christ is worth dying for, sir. Not a false gospel that was born in the 19th century that Paul says is under a curse and anyone who proselytizes it is under a curse from God. That says atonement didn't take place at the cross. No sins were canceled at the cross. Jesus is still in heaven dealing with sins. All the contradictions, the history that's just riddled with errors and plagues started by Christological heretics. Sir, the fruit of that is rotten. It's rotten. It's not worth dying for. And what you presented tonight is not the true gospel. Neither of those trees are the gospel. Richard mentioned it. It ultimately comes down to union with Christ. Not systematic theology. A person becomes united to Jesus Christ, not by understanding all the mechanics around original sin. <laughs> Believing original sin is not the power of God to salvation, such that if you believe in original sin, that's the power of God to salvation. Whether it's true or false, that's the point, is that it's not the power of God to salvation. Yes, the person at, the, at, my, at our church who doesn't check off this pietistic checklist that you guys have created that you claim is, well, that's Christian living. That's being like Jesus. If I read my Bible every day and if I go to church every Saturday and, and I check the, the box of all these things, that's pietism, sir. That doesn't mean you're united to Christ by faith. And I'm not saying you shouldn't be reading your Bible. We're blessed to live in a time where you have such ease of access to it. And you're going to be held accountable to that, of course. But this idea, man, that if a person's not doing that, they're not a Christian, or they're not, they don't understand the gospel, it's just nonsense. And the reality is, is the vast majority of Christians are that way. They're not systematic theologians, sir. They don't understand half the stuff that you're even getting into tonight. They may have an opinion on it, etc. But if that's the gospel, that's the power of God to salvation. And then you said everything that God has revealed is salvational. If you're an Adventist, understand this is why you may have been confused. This organization has set you up to be so. I was as well. I remember when a Christian first asked me to share the gospel with them. And I was like, uh, because I didn't understand. I was like, oh man, I don't have enough time to get into all this. He, he cut me off in my presentation. <laughs> Poor guy. We were eating lunch. He had to cut me off to say, hey, I don't mean to be rude. Can I share something different with you? <laughs> he gave me the simple gospel. He had his Bible there. He gave me the simple gospel message. I wasn't converted on the spot, but that stuck with me because here it is. 14 years later, 13 years later, whatever it is. Haven't forgotten it. Never will. Always stuck with me in stark contrast to this crazy, convoluted, systematic theology of just all this stuff, man. That's not the gospel. Adventists, we want you to come to know the true Christ and his gospel. Yes, it is that simple. Yes, it is a simple message. Just like the Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved, sirs? Conviction came over them. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't go into a doctoral dissertation on original sin and predestination and Calvinism and Arminianism. And... No, no. The gospel is a simple message. It is a simple message. You can be forgiven and in Dennis's eyes, he's going to say, well, forgiven is just let off the hook. No, that's not what we're saying when we say forgiven. You can be made a new creature in Christ today. Yes, a real ontological change in your being. And any person who's had this encounter with Christ 
and has been born again, they know what I'm talking about. It's a glorious thing. Because when it happens, it happens. And once it clicks and you understand, you're united to Christ by faith. There's nothing I can add to that. There's nothing I can take away from that. I'm secure in that. He's going to keep me. The days where I fall short, he chastises me. <laughs> like a good parent. He doesn't disown me. <laughs> because my eyes are not faced also inward. A lot of what you were saying tonight, Dennis, was inward face. It's all about you. You, you, you. What are you doing? What does it look like with you? And you, you. This is where the weak sacramental theology of Adventism comes in as well. When you're not doing the Eucharist weekly, you're not. Well, there's just a whole number of issues with that. But that is the gospel to your senses. It's a sign and seal of all the promises that a person has by being united to Jesus Christ by faith. You need to be seeing that and partaking of that weekly and be reminded it's outside of me. It's not internal to me. It's not about developing this inward righteousness. It's not to say that there's not change that takes place. We looked at the Westminster Confession on Sanctification tonight. So I'm not downplaying that either. But this idea of this constant focus on this inward disposition. and I mean, he's one of these folks that Christ hasn't returned because there's not enough sinlessly perfect people living the Adventist message on earth. Yet at the same time, the Sunday law is not a, a conditional prophecy. So Christ can return at any moment, but the Sunday law is not a conditional prophecy. So it has to happen before he return. All that to say, folks, please read the article on our website. Go on there and type in union with Christ. That's the core of the gospel, folks. The good news about the person and work of Jesus, that by faith you can be united to him. He'll change you. He'll make you a new creature. You'll war with your sin, yes, your whole life. And unlike Dennis is claiming, glorification doesn't happen here yet. That's something that happens after the sanctification period. They're trying to lump all this justification, sanctification, glorification all into this one over-realized period. But go on there. Read that article, please. If you stuck with us this whole time, four hours. Absolutely crazy. I did not anticipate going this long. I know I've said this like the past three weeks, I really did not anticipate going this long, but I'm glad we were able to respond to all of that because I think it was beneficial. Um, and next week, taken off from live stream, we'll have some other content that's going up uh, in the interim. And then we'll be back the following week. Test the Prophet's going to be here. So we're going to be looking at holy Batman plagiarism um, with Test the Prophet. And we're going to be doing a uh, big old stream dedicated to the evidence of Ellen White's plagiarism. So, two weeks from tonight. I believe that's the, the 28th. But as always, Adventists, our call is the same call to you that you have to us. Come out of her, my people. You know who I'm referring to when I say her? Come out, join the true Christ, uh, or join the true church by uniting yourself to the true Christ by believing his gospel. As always, until next time, God bless.